Okay, everyone, once again, I want to say thank you so much for taking your personal, valuable time to be here this evening. I want to thank Art Capozzi for setting up this event. I want to thank my friend and fellow whistleblower, Jay Parker, for the brilliant job he did in the uh, opening session of today's seminar. My presentation today is entitled, Demystifying the Occult Part Two. Satanism and the Dark Occult. And this is something that I have direct personal experiential knowledge of, not something that I learned in books. I always start my presentations with um, kind of caveats or uh, warnings, if you will, and uh, I'll step through this section kind of quickly because most people here are already familiar with my work. So this is really more for new listeners, new, wa new watchers who are, uh, you know, watching this online. I also call this section Get Over It because we're going to come back to this theme over and over again that ultimately uh, what leaving this mentality that I'm going to be talking about is all about is breaking down the human ego. It's about ego death. It's about getting over your own ego. So much of these uh, little forewarnings that I start my presentations with are about the human ego and how they can be very... The, the ego can make people very recalcitrant to grasping information because they're so worried about minutia and they're so worried about things that aren't of real significance. The first thing a lot of people will say when, you know, they'll encounter some of my work is, well, there's nothing new here. He's not presenting anything brand new or, you know, theories of his own. I've never claimed to do that. There is nothing new. There is no new human knowledge that hasn't already been uncovered, that people haven't known about in the past, that people won't learn now, that they won't learn in the future, okay? There's nothing new under the sun. This is one of the oldest occult dictums. It means that truth has always been here for us to perceive. The ego is in the way of that perception, however. All that I can do in making a, a presentation like this is I can stylize it. You know, I can give my own take on things. You know, I can give my own sense of aesthetics, apply my own sense of aesthetics to the presentation. But the knowledge is not new. The next part of this I call put on your big boy pants, okay? I'm going to talk to you like you are grown, rational adults, capable of logical thought, you know? I, I think there's a lot of people out there who are of the mindset of a child, you know? I don't think they're in this room right now, but there's a lot of people who, you know, they want to be sh sweet talked. Well, my presentation style has never been like that. It's been described by some as very intense and at times combative. And I make no bones about that. I don't apologize for it. Truth is at war with mind control and deception. So to speak the truth is a combative act. I don't present this information to be liked or to make friends or to make money. I'm not here to as a pop popularity contest. Okay, if I wanted to do that, I would tell, go out and tell people what they wanted to hear, not uncomfortable truths that they have to come to terms with and change. So I do this because I see presenting this information as a personal moral obligation to speak the truth to people so that they can make informed decisions about what's going on around them in their lives. Beware of what I call and have called in my work emotional mind control. Emotional mind control means that you're going to gauge information based upon how it makes you feel as opposed to looking at the actual data and trying to determine whether it is actually true or not. Okay, so two things that I ask everyone always to do when I present is set aside your personal perceptions of me as the presenter. I'm not the important one here, okay? The information is what is important. So if you don't get distracted by the sound of my voice, my tone, how I dress, what I look like, all these things are trivial, okay? Pay attention to the information. And be consciously aware that if you reject information just based upon how it makes you feel, that is a logical fallacy. 
You cannot gauge the veracity or the truthfulness of information upon a visceral emotional reaction that you may have to it in the moment. So I tell people, ignore this information that I'm about to present here today due to your own ego bullshit at your own peril. We will not get to it all today. I couldn't get to all of the information about occult knowledge in several lifetimes, let alone one multiple hour seminar. Not possible. So the scope is gigantic. It's immense. And um, it, this is meant to simply whet the appetite for the serious student who is going to go and do further research on their own. It's way bigger than you think. There's so much more to it than people even are prepared to accept. You know, the worldview is going to be challenged by many people who are coming to this information for the first time. So be prepared to spend time and attention, the spiritual currencies. And this information is a tapestry. It is meant to be taken in as a whole. It's meant to really be taken in with all of my other work and research, which is on my website. So I always tell people, you know, stay for the whole thing. You're going to get the tapestry if you stay for the whole thing. If you don't, you're going to miss out on the tapestry of information. To gain the maximum value of what I present, I always tell people, go to my website, go to the audio, the podcast section, and you listen to those podcasts forward in order at your own pace because it is an initiation school of sorts, that podcast series. So if you really want maximum value from the work I've presented and you want to really expand your worldview, that podcast series is what you want to pay attention to and take it at your own pace, but take it in its totality. The other thing I want to say to people whose ego may, might be a little bit, uh, you know, run away is, and I hear this all the time when I start to talk to people about the occult, they'll say to me, I don't believe in that stuff. That's somebody else's religious belief, and therefore it has no effect upon me. Well, you don't need to believe in something that someone else believes in for it to have a profound impact in your life. I look at it as possibly the most naive and foolish mindset on the face of the earth to say, well, I don't need to look at that stuff because I don't believe that it's real, and so I don't think it can have any effect upon me. I tell people this is the equivalent of stating no one's crazy religious beliefs can possibly affect me even if they violently act upon those beliefs in a way that can do me extreme harm. I mean, that's insanity. There are a lot of religious extremists out there in the world and they're willing to act upon their extremist nonsensical belief system. It doesn't make a difference whether you believe in what they believe. You don't need to believe in what they believe. They believe in it and they're willing to act upon it. You know, I mean, th this is just common logical sense. I mean, you know, extremist right-wing Christians that go and shoot up Planned Parenthood, you can get ca caught in the crossfire as you're walking to work. You know, extremist is Islamic uh, religionists can do violent, crazy violent acts and people can be affected. You don't need to believe in what they believe in. So please keep that in mind moving forward with when I talk about the belief systems of the people who are currently running the world. The other question I ask people when I talk about the occult is who are you willing to listen to? You know, are you willing to listen to somebody who just read about it in book knowledge? You know, they, they took it second hand. Are you willing to listen to people like myself and Jay Parker who were directly involved? We came from the other side. We came from the other team. You know, I was a priest within the religion of Satanism for years. So, you know, if you wanted to learn a lot about Christianity or you wanted to learn a lot about Judaism and their belief systems or you wanted to learn a lot about Islam and their belief systems, would you think it might be a good idea to go to one of their priests in their priest class and ask them what is the belief system that you subscribe to and that your adherents of your religion subscribe to? It would probably be a good idea. So I'm not giving this information secondhand. I'm telling you this is their belief system. I espoused it and I was a priest within this old religion. And Jay is explaining to you firsthand from direct satanic family bloodline connected uh, upbringing. Firsthand experience. Not from what other people have, have written or put out there in society. We've lived it. 
So, you know, it's like we're from the other team bringing the playbook of that team and explaining what they want to do. You know, we, we took that to the other side, to the other team, because we defected, and we're trying to say, hey, here's the plays they're going to run. And you know what most people do? They want to smack the playbook out of your hand. They want to say, we don't want to hear that. You know, let us do our thing. Let us, you know, believe what we want to believe. But this is exactly the situation. It's someone from within the priest class explaining to you their belief system, and it's like, you know, you're being given the plans from the other football team. So I would just recommend that people, you know, take to heart where this information is coming from. The first section, I'm going to do a brief review of the occult in general. And again, most people in this room know this information, but again, this is for those who may be new to my work. I gave a seminar last year called Demystifying the Occult. Actually, it was two years ago, almost two years ago. And um, this was done in Connecticut, and uh, Art Capozzi also hosted this one. And in it, I basically broke down what occultism is and many of the uh, positive traditions within occultism. So you might call this Demystifying the Occult Part 1 the light occult. I explained that all these occult traditions share basic commonalities, which is about the understanding and the reception of natural law, which is the moral laws that govern behavioral consequence. And in that presentation, I explained what occultism is in general. The word occult is derived from the Latin adjective occultus. Occultus means hidden from sight. A lot of people think occult means evil. It does not. It never has meant evil. It only means hidden. Okay, the Latin adjective occultus, meaning hidden, comes from the Latin verb occultare, which means to hide or to conceal or to keep secret. These terms are both derived in, ter in turn from the Latin noun oculus, meaning eye. So occultism is related to vision. It is related to what we are capable of seeing, capable of perceiving or not perceiving. C.W. Leadbeater, an occultist from uh, the uh, 20th century, said, How shall we define occultism? The word is derived from the Latin occultus, meaning hidden, so that it is the study of the hidden laws of nature. Since all the great laws of nature are in fact working in the invisible world, far more than in the visible, occultism involves the acceptance of a much wider view of nature than that which is ordinarily taken. The occultist then is the man who, understand, who studies all of the laws of nature that he can reach or of which he can hear. And as a result of his study, he identifies himself with these laws and devotes his life to the service of evolution. This is what true occultism is. It is the recognition of the laws that ultimately govern the universe. And it is the study of those laws. Though, as we will see, those laws are operating in the personal domain and they're operating in the physical domain. So they're, in, they're operating in the physical and the metaphysical domains. Occult knowledge is held by very few people, unfortunately, because a priest class, a super class of occultists, decided to sequester that knowledge and use it for their own selfish benefit. The masses of humanity remain ignorant to what occultism is and to its influence in their daily lives. That's why the world is enslaved. That's why people can continue to be manipulated and controlled because there's a small class of people who know all about these laws of nature, and there's a huge body of people who don't want to learn them because of the responsibility that is carried with that knowledge. Ultimately, folks, occultism is nothing but hidden knowledge, and it is hidden psychological knowledge, ultimately, which we're going to get to. What knowledge does occultism hide? Well, what is this hidden knowledge that we're talking about? Occultism is a body of science which is not widely known to the general population, consisting of hidden knowledge about the workings of the human psyche and the laws of nature. In other words, both the seen laws, which are the physical laws, and the unseen laws, which are spiritual laws. The minor arcana of occult knowledge, meaning the lesser knowledge, or the microcosmic knowledge, 
The knowledge of the inner world consists of knowledge of the human self, the human psyche, and how it operates, how it can be manipulated, what its motivations are. Okay? There's a, a body of knowledge that deals with the greater laws of the universe, the major arcana, the macroscopic laws, the knowledge of the heavenly bodies, all of the forces of nature, and natural law. Natural law is what I call cosmic moral law, universal moral law. And again, I've covered that extensively in past seminars, especially my natural law seminar. The major arcana also consists of the physical laws of science, which in many cases are occulted, because the people who are in control don't want us to even understand how the physical world really works, let alone the metaphysical spiritual laws. So this is the knowledge that ultimately occultism is comprised of. And I always ask people when I explain these two bodies of knowledge, what knowledge of any true importance is not contained in those two bodies of knowledge? And if you kept those two bodies of knowledge secret from other people and you sequestered it, how much of a number do you think you could do on people who just remain completely ignorant of that information? Do you think you can completely control them? Well, I don't think that that's been done. I know it's been done. Another thing people will argue and debate is that no one should be looking into the occult at all. Oh, don't look into that stuff. It's bad. Well, we already dismissed that myth that this is just something that's bad. It just means hidden. What happens with it is determined upon what kind of consciousness the individual or groups of people are doing with that knowledge. How do we use it? You know, that's the main question that needs to be asked. How is this knowledge being used? It's not that we shouldn't look into it or understand it. It's a neutral tool, as is all knowledge. All knowledge is neutral. There is no such thing as good knowledge or bad knowledge. There's just knowledge and what we do with it. So the consciousness of the wielder of this knowledge determines whether that information and knowledge is going to be used for good or evil. It's like you could take a very sharp knife and you could cook a healthy meal. You could prepare a healthy meal for, for your family and friends with it. And that would be something that is good. Or you could take that knife and you can go out and rob somebody with it at knife point, which is an act of coercion and evil. It's the same knife. It's the same tool. You know, a different consciousness is wielding the tool for a different purpose. I think people have to be much more grown up about how they think about occult knowledge. This is not something that is forbidden. Occultists, dark occultists, want us to think of it as forbidden so that we don't learn what they know and start empowering ourselves with it. Occult knowledge is, however, a double-edged blade. The knowledge contained within the occult sciences can be used for good, the uplift of human consciousness, or evil, manipulation, control, and slavery. To clearly distinguish between the different uses of this knowledge, I personally refer to occult knowledge that is employed toward the expansion of human consciousness and morality as light occultism. And I personally refer to that which is used for manipulation, control, and the suppression of consciousness as dark occultism. Practitioners of light occultism could be referred to as light occultists, magicians, light workers, or my favorite term for the light occultists, de-occultists. I consider myself a de-occultist, meaning I am trying to unveil, unhide this information so that it can be given to everyone on an equal basis they can understand how it is being used and they can empower themselves with it. Then the playing field is leveled. That's real equality. You know, that's going to be the pathway to real freedom is this knowledge. So Dio cultus, as am I, uh, reveal and spread hidden knowledge which must be known in order for freedom to be manifested. Practitioners of dark occultism, on the other hand, could be referred to as either dark occultists sorcerers, or dark workers. 
Light occultists have hidden occult knowledge for specific reasons. They've hidden it in order to prevent its complete eradication during exceedingly draconian times, or in other words, when the dark occultists rule. At other times, they've hidden it to prevent it from falling into the hands of would-be dark occultists or those who they knew, who knew that the empowerment that they could gain from such knowledge, but they wanted to use it for their own immoral purposes of deception and control. Light occultists have hidden it at times in the past to prevent it from falling into the hands of those dark occultists. Dark occultists, on the other hand, always hide this knowledge for only one reason. They hide it in order to create and maintain a power differential between those who hold this kind of knowledge and those who remain ignorant of it. Dark occultists work through fear and manipulation to bring about compliance with their own selfish will. That is dark magic. Their work, their dark great work, is always done in secrecy and it is constantly contravening the freedom and prosperity of all but themselves. Dark occultists have completely infiltrated and permeated all institutional walks of life on this planet. They maintain their control over the human population through their manipulation of these institutions. This manipulation and control is not only possible, but it's relatively easy for them to accomplish because the structure of all the institutions that they run and that they have set up on the face of the earth is based upon hierarchy and compartmentalization. Hierarchy means a chain of command or really a chain of obedience. Therein lies the problem, the chain of obedience in hierarchy. And compartmentalization means one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. All these groups seem to work completely in isolation from each other, but they're ultimately controlled by one overarching agenda that knows how they're all fitting together like pieces of a puzzle. That's compartmentalization. These two things are the hallmark of all institutions that want control, hierarchy and compartmentalization. Finally, in the uh, Demystifying the Occult Part 1 seminar, I talked about there being kind of two potential outcomes for how things could go. And, you know, I liken this to the great seal on the back of the one dollar bill, because that seal is about this time that we're living in being a great transitional time period for the earth and its people. <coughs> I call that, I call this seal uh, the world in transition. You know, ono equip this means he, she, or it favors our work, favors our project, meaning God. God favors our work. Well, which God and which work is the two questions that need to be asked there. Does the God of creation favor your work? Well, if the God of creation is favoring that work, you're trying to remove the obstacles to the light, which are the bricks, and the soul trap known as the trapezoid, which we're going to get to later in the symbolism section. You know, if you remove that, the light joins up with the earth and there's no block to the light. There's nothing to weigh us down. This pyramid being built up is the dark occultist, the dark builder's work, great work of blocking out the light of the creator from the world. That's why I made this symbol, the one great work symbol. It's about truth, freedom, love prevailing in the world. Universal enlightenment through the reception of occulted knowledge divine wisdom. The true great work of light occultists is the distribution of occult knowledge freely to humanity, thereby ending the slavery of humanity by eliminating the widespread ignorance which dark occultists exploit to gain and maintain their control. On the other hand, if uh, the dark occultists complete their dark new world order, you have a world based in darkness and slavery, a world without light, without the light of the divine. This symbol means, on, on the right here, this symbol means dark occultists rule an ignorant and enslaved population with an iron fist. The great work of dark occultism is to keep humanity in a state of general unconsciousness and slavery and to tighten that control until they obtain a threefold objective. They wish to be invincible, 
invisible and immortal. That is the goal of the dark occultists. They want total control. They want nobody to be able to see their total control or who they are. And they want to live forever in the physical world. In other words, they want to maintain and tighten that control to the extent that they literally become God on earth. That is what dark occultism is all about. It works in this world through something known as Satanism. Now when you say that word to people, there's a million different things that run through people's minds in society about what Satanism is. And most of them are rampantly, wildly off base. Most people who have, think they have a conceptualization of what Satanism is have zero clue what Satanism really is. And they don't want to know what Satanism really is. They don't want to know. When, when I tell them as a former priest of this religion what, this, what the beliefs of this religion entail, they go, their eyes go glossy, they don't want to hear it, because ultimately what they hear is, I identify with some of those beliefs. Yeah, there's a reason for that. That's what the dark occultists have been trying to do. They have been trying to make the world in their image and likeness. That's what God does, right? They want people to subscribe to their belief system at a lower level. Because people who subscribe to this belief system, which we're going to talk about, cannot control people who are out of that belief system. People to be controlled and enslaved must, at some level, be subscribers of this religion. And that's why people don't want to know about real Satanism. They want, they want to think about the Hollywood variant of it, or the Christianized, or as Jay said, the Constantinian variant of it, shall we say. False notions of Satanism abound everywhere, folks. You know, they want us to identify this belief system strictly as many people do want, to, want people to identify this belief system strictly as the worship of the Christian entity called Satan or the devil. And I assure you, while some Satanists may adhere to belief systems like that, the overwhelming vast majority, that deity has nothing whatsoever to do with their belief system at all. At all. And you could, accept, you could accept that or not accept it. And I know there are people of a very Christian bent, or again, a Constantinian Christian bent, that are never going to accept that because of what their religion tells them. And that's exactly what Satanists want them to believe. They want people to believe, I just worship this entity, and I pray to this entity, and I give it my devotion. They don't want people to understand what it really is, as we're going to get to. And it's not just about, you know, pagans and Wiccans, etc., going out into the woods and doing ceremonies and whatever. You know, does that come into play? Yes, it does. I'm not going to deny that rituals like that take place. But again, most of these people are not Satanists and they're not espousing the actual ideological form of Satanism. So you have to understand the distinction between what I call false notions of Satanism and what Satanism as, as a net, worldwide network ancient religion and set of belief systems and practices really is. Huge difference between those two variants of Satanism. Okay, It's like somebody who actually lives according to the words of Christ in the New Testament could be considered an esoteric Christian. Many of the so-called Christians running around in today's world have nothing whatsoever to do with the actual life belief, uh, writings and works that are found in the New Testament. Okay, it's all about just accepting what the church says. Okay, and this salvationist notion of Christianity. So again, just like Christianity can mean many things to different people, Satanism can mean different things to different people. The, the, I want to be clear about the form of Satanism that I'm talking about is the ideology that is running the world and keeping it in slavery. So I call this ideological Satanism. Ideological Satanism is an ancient occult religion comprised of diverse interconnected networks of worldwide adherence to its ideological belief systems. 
at its ideological core, this religion postulates that knowledge of the human psyche and the laws of the universe should be occulted, meaning hidden, and held only by a very few human beings in the know. It is much more accurate to perceive Satanists and dark occultists in general as ancient psychologists who hold and wield hidden information in ways which exploit those who still remain ignorant of that knowledge. You have to look at this as ancient psychology. These are psychologists who were handed, their, their bloodlines from the ancient past were handed all of the knowledge about how the human mind operates and all of the knowledge about how the real laws of nature operate. And then those selected bloodlines held that knowledge secret from other people and they did an absolute number on their minds. And we're not coming out of that number that was done upon the minds of the people of this planet until we know what they know. Get over it. It's the truth for all time. You know, all the religionists out there who insist, no, you shouldn't look into this. You don't know what you're talking about and your ego's in the way. And that's what Satan is. Satan is the egoic force of self-identification that will not allow a human being to say, I was wrong and I was duped. That's what Satan ultimately is. Through the power differential that Satanists gain by way of manipulating those who remain in ignorance of this occulted knowledge, this small minority of those who are in the know wish to permanently rule the masses of humanity and effectively become God on earth. This is one of their goals. Absolutely. They don't want to worship any deity. They want to become deity. That's what Satanists believe. It is important to understand that contrary to popular belief, the overwhelmingly vast majority of Satanists do not worship an externalized deity known as Satan in the Christian tradition sense of that, that being. But instead, they see Satanism as an ideological way of being in the world. And they view the ego-driven self, the ego-driven and ego-identified self, as the quote-unquote God of their religion. Folks, absolutely, much more than the individuals who are in the rear picture there, the, the, that individual who is in the front of this slide right there is much more likely to be a Satanist, is much more likely to be a real Satanist, okay? And yet that's a person someone would look at and go, wow, there's a great, there's a good businessman, probably rolling in dough. You know, young, good-looking, three-piece suit, probably works for a big law firm or a big ad agency. You know, who wouldn't want to be in the, that position? And I guarantee you, more so than even individuals like this, someone like this, right there in their mind, is the satanic ideology. I guarantee it. Why name this quote-unquote religion or ideology after the biblical or Christian Satan. The, symbolisms, the symbolism and trappings of the Christian devil or Satan are used in modern Satanism, and they are. And they're used for two main reasons. The first reason that these the symbolism and trappings are used is to try to make outsiders of Satanism see Satanism as quote-unquote, just another quaint religious belief that is based upon traditional Christian belief systems. That's what they want outsiders to think. Oh, those Satanists, it's named after Satan. They, they're, they're just, they believe in Christian stuff. They worship the Christian devil. That's, that's how easily it can throw people off the idea of what real, true ideological Satanism is. And we're going to get to its main tenets. The second reason they use these symbols and trappings is to associate Satanism with the adversarial dynamic in nature, which is Satan in the Hebrew language. The adversarial dynamic in nature is referred to in the occult world as involution, the process which works against the true evolutionary force or the evolution of consciousness. Involution 
holds consciousness back and holds it in a state of slavery. The word Satan itself comes from the Hebrew word Shin Tav Final Nun. It is spelled in Hebrew, written there. And that word means adversary or opposer. So again, Satanism is the adversarial force, the force that works against true evolution in consciousness. Satanism is ultimately about being opposed to the true order of natural law. And natural law is the universal laws of morality, which govern behavioral consequences, govern the behavioral consequences of beings who are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence and free will, meaning human beings. We are in that category of beings. Therefore, natural law applies to us. The laws of morality apply to us. And ultimately what Satanism is and what all dark occultism is, is fighting against is natural law, the true order. They want to turn that over on its head and set up their own so-called order, which is no, no, it's no, no such thing as order. It's chaos and slavery. So let's get into my personal background and my personal involvement with Satanism. I was born, and there's not going to be too many pictures. As a matter of fact, in doing this presentation, I realized I, I have very little pictures of myself from back then, or even pictures with family, you know. I, I'm not a, a person who's big into nostalgia. Never was. You know, I, I've always tended to live in the moment and have this idea of present moment awareness, but uh, I don't really keep a whole lot of photographs Digitally now, I do more than I did in the past, but in the past, I have very little actual, you know, photographic documentation, I guess you could say. I wasn't a big camera person or picture taker. Um, so this is a, a shot, actually, of me from the mid-90s when I was at the height of my involvement in Satanism. I was born into a traditional and typical Roman Catholic Italian-American family from South Philadelphia. In my youth, I accepted without much questioning a great deal of the religious dogma which was given to me by family members and school teachers. In my late grade school and early high school years, I began to question those dogmatic religious beliefs. But because I lacked the knowledge of astrotheology, again, this is something that a lot of religion is based upon, and uh, you, know, you can look into it in my work on my website and my other videos, because I lacked the knowledge of astrotheology at the time, which could have helped me uh, to put that religious indoctrination into perspective, the questioning that I was undergoing turned to extreme anger and rage. And I acted upon that anger and ignorance by saying, I'm going to go out and find the polar opposite. I'm going to go out and find the polar antithesis of this Christian belief system that I was indoctrinated into and lied, uh, lied to about what it really was. And I found that polar opposite in the form of Levian Satanism, which I'm going to explain what that is. But Satanism and dark occultism in general were the ideologies that I gravitated to. And I did this as a um, rebellion against the belief system into which I was personally born. I began to espouse through my own writings and through my own music the ideology of the branch of Satanism called Levian Satanism. And I formed a death metal band in the past that sung about the ideology of Satanism. It was called Insatanity, a mixture of the word insanity and Satan. We got signed fairly quickly to a European recording label in Greece, and we released one full-length album, which was called Divine Decomposition, pictured there on the left. It promoted the satanic ideology, particularly the ideology of Levian Satanism in its lyrics. And I also wrote uh, and espoused the satanic ideology in, in uh, zines, Mini magazines, they are, they're called fanzines. You don't see too many of them around nowadays, but back then before the internet, before blogs, you know, these were the blogs of, of the uh, early 90s. So I wrote for fanzines and espoused the satanic ideology in them. 
eventually some of my work in writing and in music was noticed by Anton LaVey. He was the high priest at that time of the organization called the Church of Satan, which operated in San Francisco. Its headquarters have since been moved to New York City. LaVey himself, in March of 1997, granted me the rank of priest within the organization called the Church of Satan. And he did this himself through... I didn't ask for the appointment. He appointed me because he said that I was an excellent spokesperson for the ideology and therefore wanted to give me the rank, wanted me to come out to San Francisco and meet him, and he wanted me to head a grotto on the East Coast. Grottos are what Satanists refer to their uh, congregations. It's like a, a coven in Wicca or in other pagan religions. So I was offered a grotto leadership on the East Coast, which I subsequently turned down. I turned it down because at the time I viewed Satanism solely as a personal belief system to be employed for personal objectives. And I didn't like, as I still don't like, group think and group ideologies and congregations, etc. So I turned down that appointment to head a grotto, but I did accept the appointment to the priest class of the religion. And LaVey and other Satanists hooked me up with many Satanists in the local tri-state area. And I began attending rituals in my tri-state area and getting to know some of the other people involved. We'll get to that in a moment. This is my actual appointment, the, the, the paper which arrived in the mail and appointed me to the the rank of priest within the Church of Satan. It's signed by LaVey himself. He died about a year later. And um, the letter on the right is from um, his uh, life partner, Blanche Barton, which I, I'll read both. It says, From the office of Anton Xander LaVey, be it known on this day, March 19th, the year 32, which translates to the year 1997, Mark Rokar has been appointed to the office of priest of the Church of Satan and is empowered to act in that capacity, signed Anton Sander, Zander LeVay. Uh, it does not have the name Passio on it because I did not use my legal last name when I was involved in Satanism. I chose a name based on a demon name, which I'll explain on the next slide. Uh, the letter on the right from Blanche Barton was written the next day. And again, March 19th and 20th are very significant dates. That's the spring equinox dates. Uh, we'll get to why that, those are significant dates later in the presentation. But it says, to Mr. Mark Rokar, there's my home address. Dear Mr. Rokar, Dr. LeVay has been favorable, favorably impressed with the skill and mastery you have shown in various opportunities to represent the Church of Satan as the Church of Satan, and Satanism in general. You have proven yourself to be magically and materially adept. Therefore, he felt it was high time you were granted the title of priest in recognition of your dedication, knowledge, and ability. Congratulations, Reverend Rokar. Keep, please keep us abreast of your activities, interviews, and musical releases. May the fires of hell continue to strengthen and inspire you. Hail Satan, Blanche Barton, who was basically LaVey's, uh, performed secretarial duties for Anton LaVey, the high priest of the Church of Satan at the time. Now, before we go any further, I want to say this does not mean anything, okay? This organization is very, very low level in the worldwide hierarchical network of Satanism. Extremely low level. And I'm going to explain where it fits into that hierarchy. But to think that because I got an appointment to a priesthood, a low-level priesthood in a low-level organization, that that made me some kind of a big shot in the satanic worldwide hierarchy, it doesn't mean that. Okay? I saw things from a very low level, and that was enough. I don't make any bones, or, or I, don't, I don't make any claims to even being to seeing or having the knowledge that someone like Jay Parker had from being in the family he was born into. Okay? He saw things that I certainly never saw. But once again, 
I saw enough to know that that's certainly where it goes without any question in my mind. The name that I took, I'll briefly explain, is from a Gnostic text that was, I believe, part of the Nag Hammadi library called the Pistis Sophia, which means the faith wisdom. And it's essentially a conversation between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And in part of the book, Jesus is describing what hell is like, okay? When, you know, in, in this Gnostic tradition, when sinners die and go to hell, they're put into certain uh, areas of chastisement. So they, you know, basically undergo certain torments and then learn their lessons about what they did wrong. Kind of like the earth. <laughs> but... Um, Here's, here's where I got the name that I chose in Satanism from. From the Pista Sophia, Mary said unto Jesus, What type is the outer darkness, meaning hell? And how many regions of chastisement are there in it? Jesus answered and said unto Mary, The outer darkness is a great dragon whose tail is in its mouth, outside the whole world and surrounding the whole world. Within it there are twelve mighty chastisement dungeons with a ruler in every dungeon, each ruler having a different face. In the eleventh dungeon is a multitude of rulers, and every one of them has seven cat-faced heads. The great ruler over them in this region is called Rokar. I'm born under the sign of Leo. I've always heavily identified with the great cats, the lion, the tiger, etc. I would consider them my familiar animals. So therefore, I wanted to choose a symbolic demon that was appropriate to my sun sign, Leo. And therefore, I chose Rokar from a Gnostic Christian text. I immediately began to recognize through further involvement by attending rituals in and around my area that Satanism was not what I thought it was originally. As my involvement grew and I attended meetings and rituals held by satanic groups in my tri-state area, I began to become aware that this was not an isolated group of individuals who were simply working with occult knowledge for their own personal reasons, as I was doing. See, my motivation was, if I can get a leg up on my fellow man and I can come out on top, and I can manipulate people, and I can make more money than them, and I can get in, you know, a better influence, maybe, you know, get the job over somebody else. Well, that'll give me a leg up over people in the world. And that was my ego-based mindset at the time. I want things for me. I want to serve me only. And, I, and if, if I have to do, you know, manipulations against people to get what I want, then so be it. And that's why I was heavily attracted to the ideology of Satanism. Because this is what Satanism is especially lower-level Satanism. So when I started participating with other group Satanists, in other words, network Satanists, I realized this is not what this is. This is way bigger than that. This involves way more than that, and this is about control over people. You know, I wanted to come out on top over other people, but, you know, just because I knew a little bit more than them. I was not about human slavery. Never was. And when I started to realize that that's what Satanism at a much higher level was about, I, I, I was like, whoa, you know, I need to check myself and take a step back here. So these groups of Satanists were comprised of an eclectic array of people from every walk of life and every social institution on the face of the earth, including politics, okay? There were people running for political office at just about every level, okay? State to local, to some national politicians. Law, there were lawyers within Satanism, judges, bankers, people in the media, People in the military, military and police, uh, their ranks are, believe it or not, filled much more than you would even like to b believe or think about. 
how many police and military people are directly involved with satanic grottos. Entertainment, even sports, medicine, doctors, and teachers. Many teachers, I saw, and especially college level, university level teachers were present at satanic rituals. And there's a reason for this. They're putting their people into point positions of power. They're working them into all of the social institutions. That's how they get their bidding done. That's how they advance their group agenda. These were people in positions of great influence and power throughout our entire society. And as my involvement with them grew, I became aware over time that they were not working separately toward their own individual goals as I was doing. Instead, they were working together as a tight-knit unit of a hierarchical worldwide network toward one common goal, and that goal was to increase their own collective power at the expense of everybody else's freedom. In other words, they wanted to become the kings of the world and enslave everybody else in the process. That was their goal. And they talked about it openly and plainly. I don't know how many people just saw the uh, people from the BLM, you know, at some banquet together talking about how they're beating all of these people out of land, you know. They're giving, them, they're giving them pennies on the dollar, laughing about it, laughing about how they just basically robbed two old World War II veteran men who were living together out on this lot, this lot of property out somewhere in New Mexico or something, and it was a mine worth over $40 million, you know, and they acquired it for pennies on the dollar, and they were laughing about it. And they were laughing about how much land they hold in you know, governmental hands versus how much land is still held in the public hands. And they were laughing about it as if we own the entire western portion of the country. Thinking it's funny that they helped the government do this. But, see, they didn't know there was a hidden camera in that room. You know? So they were talking about it very blatantly and openly. Actually even saying, we're the bad guys. We steal money. We beat people for what their property is worth. And we take it for pennies on the dollar. Saying things like this openly, blatantly, and then laughing about it. Laughing about it. This is what it was like at satanic rituals and meetings. These people talk very plainly among themselves. They know what they're doing. They know how to get it done. They're doing it, and they're laughing about it. And here's why I ultimately decided to get out. I still possessed a small amount of conscience at the time. It wasn't much, believe me. I was borderline psychopathic in my youth because I was given no real knowledge growing up. I, my physical needs were met and I never lacked for any of that. But emotionally and spiritually, you know, did I really have a proper upbringing? Was I truly raised? No. I was taught not to try to do blatant harm to other people, things like that, what we're all taught. But was I really taught anything about what was really going on in the world? No. Was, was I taught to get involved in things that are truly right and stand, take a stand against evil? No. You know? I wasn't activated with real knowledge. That's the, what the goal of real parenting should be to do with a, with a child if you're going to take the responsibility of bringing a child into the world, okay? And that wasn't done with me. And I'm not saying I hate my family because of it. It's that they were ignorant and, you know, mind-controlled as well. But I didn't have what you could call activated conscience earlier in life. <laughs> Let's just say <laughs> at, at all. But there was still enough there that I didn't think enslaving the population of the people of Earth was something that we should be trying to do. There was at least that much conscience left. So as I became aware that I had become involved at a very low level with such a sinister organized syndicate, that made me take a step back and made me reevaluate my own worldview and my own behavior. I came to the realization that these low-level satanic groups were actually operating as a psychological vetting and filtration system. Now, take heed of that term. 
a psychological vetting and filtration system. So I'm going to read you the application of even a low-level organization like the Church of Satan in a, in, a, in a moment. And that is a filtration system for their worldwide hierarchical system of totalitarian control, which is based in the ideology of dark occultism. Low-level satanic orders such as the Church of Satan act as an interface with the general public and serve as a wide-scale effort to locate people with certain personality traits and skill sets. And one of the skill sets they were looking for, particularly, I, I believe, with someone like me, was communication skill sets. I'm sorry, let me take a step back. They, they, low-level satanic orders such as the Church of Satan act as an interface with the public and serve as a wide-scale effort to locate people with certain personality traits and skill sets, which the larger network of dark occultists desire to exploit for their own purposes. Such individuals are then groomed for placement into positions of power within social institutions in order to advance their predetermined group agenda. So it is a psychological vetting and filtration system, and they're looking for psychopathic characteristics. People who will step up and take part in the enslavement of their fellow man. Here's what I look at the general organizational, and again, it's not very detailed, it's a very general organizational chart of how these low-level satanic orders operate within uh, as an interface to, with the general public to bring people up into their lower ranks. So low-level dark occult groups such as the Church of Satan, this would be, you know, down here, low-level dark occult orders, Church of Satan, Temple of Set, etc. Operate as psychological vetting and filtration systems for the worldwide hierarchical satanic network of totalitarian control. Low-level satanic orders such as the Church of Satan act as an interface with the general public and serve as a wide-scale effort to locate people with certain personality, skill, personality traits and skill sets which they want to exploit. Now, as you go up through that organization, they're taking people from the general public, they're working them at, into the low-level positions of these orders. So then you go up here and they would put some of those people in, if, at this level financial control, political control, media control, etc. These organizations are also run by dark occultists. And they're filtering people once they groom them from these lower levels, they'll groom them up into positions of power at that level. Then it goes up into higher levels of power and higher levels of dark occultism from there. Higher level dark occult orders such as Skull and Bones. Um, the, the intelligence agencies are dark occult orders. Um, Bohemian Club, etc., you know, and think tank organizations like Tavistock Institute and um, the Bilderberg Group, etc. Then you have highest level dark occultists from ancient ruling family bloodlines. Again, these very ancient families that come right out of, you know, the ancient world, old Egypt, connected to the pharaohs, the, the, the kings of Sumer, you know, and Ur, and right back into the pre-Diluvian age. So, you know, and then it connects back up with non-human entities, which I've talked about in some of my other work. I'm not really going to get big into that today. But you have to understand that that's how these low-level groups work. They, they are a psychological vetting and filtration system. Let's take a look at the Church of Satan's app membership application. Okay? This is the Church of Satan's membership, active membership application. Give your complete name, your mailing address, your telephone number, your email address, your sex, your date of birth, your place of birth, height, weight, color of eyes, color of hair, marital status, uh, name, birth date, and birthplace of spouse if married, number of children and their ages, previous religion, religious affiliations and offices held, nationality, ethnic background, current citizenship, educational background and degrees, present occupation, special interests, talents, abilities, hobbies, collections. I am interested in part participating in special interest groups, yes or no. I am interesting, interested in participating in contact with local active members. I remember checking that one, yes, that's how I got involved. 
I am interested in serving as a contact point or media representative in my area, yes or no. Okay. Now, here's the questions that you have to, on separate sheets of paper, provide answers to in the form of essays, okay, you, like extended answers. Provide answers to all of the following questions on additional sheets of paper. What are your impressions of the Satanic Bible, the book written by Anton LaVey, which basically coalesces the Satanic ideology into a book? And he was put up to writing that book. He was put up to writing it by higher level dark occultists. This has come out in the past by one of his children, explaining that he was asked, he was charged to write that book to give the whole ideology of Satanism in a much lower, watered down level to the general public to identify people who would be drawn to that belief system and then again flow into their ranks. What do you expect to accomplish through membership in the Church of Satan? If you were granted three wishes, what would they be? What is your attitude toward animals? If you have any pets, describe them. What is your ideal animal? Now you're going to see as these questions go deeper and deeper, this is a psychological profile. They're building a psychological profile so that they can identify what can we get out of this person? How can we use them? How psychopathic are they already? Are you satisfied with your sex life? Describe your ide ideal of a physically attractive sex partner. What is your life's goal? What steps have you taken to attain your life's goal? Do you find any of our tenets objectionable? If so, which tenets are objectionable to you and why? How many years would you like to live? What are your musical tastes? Provide examples. Cite four motion pictures you consider your favorites and why. What are your food preferences? Cite four books you consider your favorite and why. If you own an automobile, describe it. What is your ideal automobile? As a child, what were your favorite pastimes? What was your disposition like as a child? Of which country other than the one in which you now reside would you prefer being a resident? In what type of dwelling do you live? Describe your ideal home. Describe your political philosophy. What is your personal definition of magic? Do you feel oppressed or persecuted in any way? If so, explain why. Are you self-sufficient or are you most productive in a group? Do you make friends easily if you so choose? What is more important to you, self-satisfaction or approval from others? Would you rather influence others or be influenced by others? Do you feel you have leadership capabilities? Do you, feel, do you consider yourself a good judge of character? In what orga other organizations do you hold membership? Have you possessed or used illegal drugs? Or have you ever been convicted of a crime? If so, explain in full. And again, drug use is extremely frowned upon in this form of Satanism. And I'll tell you what, the number one frowned upon substance over any other substance is? What? Cannabis. Cannabis. Thank you. I mean, you were practically ostracized if you even talked about cannabis. Because they know its healing potential and power. They know not only its healing potential physically, but psychologically. And they don't want anybody touching it. Uh, let's see, where was I? Describe a significant experience in your life bordering on what you can, would consider the paranormal or the demonic, if any. <clears throat> what forms of entertainment do you prefer? T tell one of your favorite jokes. Have you ever served in the armed forces? If so, provide pertinent data. How long did it take you to join the Church of Satan since becoming aware of it? Are you a smoker? If so, to what extent do you smoke? Have you accomplished anything important or significant in your life? If so, what? Which parent do you admire most and why? Do you drink alcoholic beverages? If so, to what extent? State your preferences. Do you have any tangible services or resources which you would care to contribute to our organization? Are you free to travel? And if so, to what extent? Give your personal definition of Satan. Provide your signature attesting to the above and enclose a personal photograph. 
that's not a psychological profile, then I don't know what is. Here's how easy I got out. And when I tell this story to people, they find it difficult to believe because they think this is like the mafia where they're going to come after you because you know where all the bodies are buried. Well, one, I didn't know where the bodies were buried because at the level of Satanism I was involved in, they didn't go and just go out and perform crimes, okay, and like take you into that whole criminal syndicate world. They talked openly about how they controlled everything and what their plans were, but you know, there were no actual physical crimes committed at this level. I'm sure once you do get into levels that are doing that, then they do very much care when you're saying, goodbye guys, I'm ready to get out. You know, but not at the level I was involved in. Upon understanding how these satanic organizations worked and how I was being used, my conscience would not allow me to proceed any further, so I pulled away from any continued affiliations with these groups. They were completely unconcerned that I did not want to be further involved with their agenda. One Satanist actually told me, do your worst, when I expressed the desire to expose their plans to the public. He said that I would be, quote unquote, banging my head against a concrete wall for the rest of my life. Another told me that the general population was already so completely mind controlled by dark occultists that if they themselves went public with their plans and explained to people what they have already done and what they are planning to do in the future, that the public would not even accept the truth from them. Think about that. They said if we came forward and explained who we were and how we've done what we have done and what we plan to do, the public will not accept it from us. We could not take them out of the mind-controlled trance that they are in, even if we wanted to. So they basically said, you want out? Well, don't let the door hit you in the ass. That was their attitude. Years later, and after much deeper research into human consciousness and light occultism, I eventually began teaching others about the influence and manipulation techniques employed by these dark occultists, I began teaching them about their profoundly warped ideologies and their global agenda for totalitarian control, which many have come to call the New World Order. I call it the Dark New World Order. Let's look at the main tenets of the satanic ideology, the main belief system tenets of this old religion. And before we go into what I call the four overarching tenets. Let's look at some of the things they put out publicly about what they're about. This is called the Nine Satanic Statements from Anton LaVey's book called The Satanic Bible. Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Okay? So it's all about feeding the self. Living for pleasure pursuits. Now I'm not saying everybody should just, you know, live a totally ascetic monk-like lifestyle. Okay, I've never claimed that, you know. I have no problem with people experiencing pleasure here on earth. It's when you make that your highest thing that you identify with and that you want to live for that all the time that it becomes a problem, okay. So this is the number one thing that Satan represents to Satanists. It doesn't say it represents the Christian devil and that we should get on our knees and worship it. It says it represents indulgence, meaning I get what I want. That's the first thing Satan represents to Satanists. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. And I just want to say, this is what Satanism represents to the Satanist for the Satanist. Okay? It is, the, the, the Satanist does not want these things for others. It wants these things for themselves only. Okay? Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Satan represents... This is a very important one, this seventh one right here. Satan represents man as just another animal. 
sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who because of his quote-unquote divine spiritual and intellectual development has become the most vicious animal of all. Eight, Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. Nine, Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. Satanism also has sins. They have things that their membership should never do or should never participate in. Now, I described this section, the nine satanic sins, the so-called satanic quote-unquote sins. These are what Satanists forbid among their own ranks, but that which they wish to peddle to everyone else so that everyone else is easier to manipulate and control. The nine satanic sins, stupidity. That's the first thing they want the public to be. But they don't want to be stupid. They want to have all the knowledge. They want the public stupid. Pretentiousness. Solipsism. Again, meaning that there is no such thing as truth. The belief that truth does not exist. Satanists don't think that truth does not exist. Satanists think truth exists and they want to understand it and keep it from other people. So they can control those people who are in that level of ignorance to the truth. So they want to peddle solipsism to other people. That's why solipsism is so gigantic in the New Age movement religion. Huge, huge belief system in New Ageism. The idea that there's no such thing as truth. Or that, oh, it's all just perception. It's my truth, your truth, her truth, his truth. Number four, self-deceit. Five, herd conformity. Again, they don't consider themselves members of the human herd. They want everybody else to be herd conformist, but not them. You know, they want to be the farmers who rule the herd. Lack of perspective. Forgetfulness of past orthodoxies. Counterproductive pride and lack of aesthetics. Round out the so-called satanic sins. I would say the most important there is solipsism, that Satanists warn their own ranks. First of all, that's not even a word or an ideology that is very much often heard or used. And they took it upon themselves to put that very high up in their list of quote-unquote sins because they want their membership to know what solipsism is and know that they should not be participating in it, but they want to peddle that to everybody else. What I identified as the overarching four main tenets of Satanism are as follows. Selfishness is the highest goal. And you know, no bones are made about this by their, their rank and file members. The first tenet of Satanism is the dictum that, quote unquote, self-preservation is the highest law. And this is about more than just physical survival. Okay? Put in other words, the survival and comfort of the physical self is always a more important goal than doing what is morally right. Live for yourself only and care, only care about you and yours. If you must step on others to get what you want, then so be it, for this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. The tenet that clearly defines the overarching worldview of Satanism is perpetual Non-stop, me, 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 thinking. Now, do you think that's the ideology that is in most people in this world? Do most people think like that? All day, every day? Would you agree or disagree that the vast majority of individuals in our society subscribe to such a selfish worldview? Absolutely. That's what I'm going to call later mini-me Satanism. They have to peddle their belief down to people at a lower level without them being consciously aware that this is a religion that they have subscribed to for them to be under their thumb and controlled by them. The second main tenet of Satanism is moral relativism. Moral relativism is the ideology that there is no objective difference between right and wrong behavior, 
So human beings may arbitrarily, quote-unquote, create or, quote-unquote, decide right and wrong for themselves based upon their own whims and preferences. See, right isn't something that exists in nature. You know, your, your rights are something that can be made up and then taken away if we so choose. We'll decide what is right and wrong. We'll decide what a right is and what it is not. You know? In other words, that which we consider, quote unquote, right for ourselves is that which is right. And that which we consider wrong for ourselves is that which is wrong. That's the ideology of moral relativism. Since according to the inherent and objective laws of morality, natural law, the aggregate amount of morality present in the lives of the people of any given society is directly proportional to the amount of freedom in that society. Or in other words, as morality increases, freedom increases. As morality declines, freedom declines. Since that law is eternally true, true freedom can never exist in a society that embraces moral relativism. Can not exist. Can never exist in a society. Freedom cannot, can never exist in a society that embraces the ideology of moral relativism. It is an impossibility according to the laws of nature. And yet, how many people in our society, ladies and gentlemen, would you say subscribe to? the ideology of moral relativ relativism, that there is no objective right or wrong in nature itself, you know, we get to make up what a right is. You know, man can make that up and then grant that right to other people. And then if we so choose the next day, we can pass a law and we can say, no, that action is no longer a right. We'll jail you, we'll throw you in a cage for performing that behavior. Our entire society is based is built upon moral relativism called the laws of man. And the vast majority of the zombie walkers that we have floating around this society are also adherents of the religion of moral relativism. It, it, they're, they're, they believe in the religion of Satanism without even understanding what it is or understanding that they are a member of that religion by their own beliefs. The third tenet of Satanism is social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is the extension of the theory of Darwinian macrobiological quote-unquote evolution into human society. You're extending that theory into the human societal domain. The proponents of Darwinian macrobiological evolution postulate the notion of the survival of the quote fittest animals, meaning that animals who are the most dominant will rule their social strata. Applied to the human domain, this theory puts forward the notion that, one, it is the quote-unquote natural order. How many times have I heard this one? And even desirable for human society to be ruled by the most dominating and vicious human beings. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've been told that with a serious, straight look on people's face. That, hey, this is just the natural order. The dominant, the alpha humans come out on top and they just rule over everybody else. That's just the way things are. It's just the natural order of things. There's nothing natural in that, folks. And believe me, there's no order in it. You're only going to get chaos from believing in that belief system. The second postulation of social Darwinism is that such humans' genes, their genes, are the reason that they acquire their position of power and their genes are the reasons they maintain those positions of power. It doesn't have to do anything with the, the situation societally that they maybe have, were born into or, you know, the amount of resources they were handed at their birth or the bloodlines they come from because they were born for, from super rich ruling families? No. It has nothing to do with that. Their genes got them there and maintained that position. You know? It has nothing to do with people's belief in money and that they'll do any absolutely wretched behavior if given enough money you know, for, their, for their own enslavers. No. Their genes maintain that position for them. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it makes a whole lot of logical sense, too. Not only is it sick and parasitic, but you can see how much sense it actually makes. Would you agree or disagree that the vast majority of individuals in our society subscribe to the ideology of social Darwinism? And I would say, yeah. I'd say most people do. More than not. The fourth and final tenet takes the entire ideology to its final solution, you might say. Eugenics. Or what I'm going to start calling dysgenics and epi-eugenics, which I'm going to start calling epidisgenics, because there's nothing good about it. They're not trying to create something good on the other side, folks. They are definitely degrading the human genome. That's what dysgenics is. Let's talk about the word eugenics, the classically defined word eugenics. The word eugenics is derived from the Greek adjective uh, eugens, eugenes, I'm sorry. And eugenes means well-born, which is in turn derived from the Greek adjective eu, meaning good, and the Greek noun genos, meaning race or stock. Eugenics is a social ideology advocating the promotion of higher rates of sexual reproduction for people with traits and characteristics desired by its proponents. Well, let me say that again. Eugenics is a social ideology advocating the promotion of higher rates of sexual reproduction for people with traits and characteristics desired by its proponents. And then simultaneous to that, it puts forward the notion of reduced rates of sexual reproduction and sterilization for those with undesired traits and characteristics. So we want there to be more births of people who have the traits and characteristics we desire, and we want there to be less births of people who have the traits and characteristics we do not desire. This tenet describes the ideology of Satanism taken to its ultimate conclusion. It goes something like this. Since man is God, and he gets to make up what right and wrong are, and since it is simply the, quote, natural order for the most ruthless of humans, whose genes are the fittest, to rule the rest of the human herd, then that elite class of human beings in the highest positions of power in the world have every right to decide who is allowed to live and procreate and who must die. That's eugenics, folks. And that's what's going on in this society. But you know the even much more sinister thing that's going on in this society? Epi-eugenics. Epi-eugenics is taking place and people are completely unaware of it. Even people who have heard about eugenics, they think of it as forced sterilization like was going on back in the 20s. They don't need to force anything anymore. We're calling ourselves we're calling ourselves, and we're giving birth to traits and characteristics in the next generations that are coming down that are tailor-bred for slavery. And we're doing it completely unconsciously because we don't see what these human farmers are doing to our minds. Epi-eugenics, a word which I have coined myself, is the propagation of eugenics by way of mind control and quote unquote selective breeding by the very population which the eugenics strategy is targeted to destroy. One could call it getting the herd to cull itself. This gene culling strategy is seen most readily and most disturbingly in the rabid androgenization of genders in Western culture and the modern neo-feminist movements, ideology, and practices. And I am going to be covering this in an extensive two-day presentation that I'll be giving at Free Your Mind 4. This will be my topic. 
It's going to be called the unholy feminine. Neo-feminism and the satanic epigenics agenda. Perhaps it would be better to refer to the strategies of eugenics and epigenics as employed by dark occultists as dysgenics and epidysgenics, which I think are much more appropriate terms. We need to stop using the word you in the first part of eugenics, meaning good in Greek. There's nothing good about it, folks. It is to degrade human genetics and ultimately to degrade the human soul. Hey, Mark. I'll take questions at the end of the presentation. You can go right ahead, absolutely. I'm going to take some time right here to, give an, uh, to uh, screen an interview with an actual Satanist that was also a priest in the organization that I was a priest within the Church of Satan. He subsequently left the Church of Satan. And he left it because he said it was not evil enough for him. He said it was not hardcore enough for him. He said it was not fascist enough for him. And he said it did not advocate eugenics in a brutal enough fashion for him. Now, how psychopathic is that? However, to this person's credit, in this interview you will see how psychopathic this person is. To his credit, later, many years later, many years after I came out of this mentality, he finally did break this mentality and became a Buddhist. You know, I'm not saying he went all the way and became a spiritual anarchist, but hey, it's a lot better than where he was, okay? You know, sometimes we got to do this in stepwise progressions. His name is Nicholas Schreck, and he was the uh, life partner at the time of Anton LaVey's daughter, Zena, Zena LaVey. So you are going to hear him talk about his music promoting the satanic ideology in this interview. I want you to pay very specific attention to some of the things he says, so here we go. Nicholas Schreck. Hi, this is Tom Metzger, your host for Race and Reason again, that longest running show of its type on cable access TV. Seen around the country on many, many, many local cable access systems. And those cable access systems serve many times three, four, sometimes five towns and cities. And we're dedicated, of course, to freedom of speech, true freedom of speech, which upsets some of our opposition. We feel we're an island of free speech and a sea of controlled and managed news. And if you don't think news and so forth is controlled, only 26 corporations control all the media in the United States. So today, we have a very interesting guest who has been on the show before. His name is Nicholas Schreck, and he has a musical group and organization called Radio Werewolf that he terms a musical terrorist organization. And he's also a revisionist writer who has written a book called The Study of Charles Manson. Nice to have you here. Always a pleasure Nicholas. to be here, Tom. How are you? What's been happening to Nicholas Schreck since the last time we met? Well, we're entering phase two of Radio Werewolf's operation for world dominion. And what we're waging is a cultural war right now on every front, in music, in literature, utilizing the media against itself. Um, what we're trying to do is bring back a resurgence of the Western European tradition that has been all but lost in the world. And we're using music because that's the, that's the instrument that young people respond to right now. We're doing propaganda directly to awaken the wolf in man because the wolf is a symbol of Western European power and fury, and that's why we use the werewolf imagery. Now you have um, used what you had termed neo-Gothic music in the past. Well, Gothic of course, is a, is a Germanic tribe. And there's a spirit 
to the Western people that is unique in the world. And it, it is a Gothic spirit, and I think that's the purest form of, of Western culture, and I think we keep that flame alive in Radio Werewolf. I understand you're talking about the evolution of this, that uh, your music is getting more into the political... Well, our, our music, well I wouldn't say political, because no. we transcend politics. Politics is merely the puppet show of human beings, and we transcend that, but we are interested in the control of human beings for our own purposes. You have a symbol on your left arm here. Could you sort of scoot right. over? This is, sort of, what, this is, what the, is this? This is the 13th rune in the ancient runic alphabet of the Norse people, and it represents Yggdrasil, the tree of life. And this is the meeting point between life and death. Is that the tree that Odin was supposed to have been crucified on? Exactly, and it's the tree that symbolically supports the universe. And the wolf's angle symbol we use as the symbol for the Abraxas Foundation, which is sort of a Thule society for the 90s. <clears throat> In the words of my collaborator Boyd Rice, it's a fascist occult think tank. And what we're doing is coming up with new strategies and techniques to bring this cultural renaissance into the future, into the 90s. I notice you have a wolf's <coughs> ring uh, on your finger there. Well, as I've explained, the wolf has always been a particularly Western European image. And the wolf represents the beast in man. That's what we seek to unleash in humanity because it's been repressed and tamed by Judeo-Christian values. And that, above all, is what we seek to eradicate. The wolf should be unleashed. We can hearken back to Norse mythology where Fenris, the ancient wolf, God was unleashed upon the world, and the god Adamarung occurred, the Ragnarok, the end of the world. And symbolically, that is what we are undergoing right now in so, history, an end of the old order, an end of the old world, and the beginning of a new order. The end of the economic determinist uh, idea and moving towards race and culture? Of every idea, of every traditional idea of the past. In my opinion, we're living in a dead world. All the traditions of the past are decadent, dead, corrupt, and anyone who continues to cling to them are like maggots clinging to a corpse. So the music today, you would see it as a... Uh... Music of today is absolute swill. It's designed to keep young people passive, restrained, and it's designed to tame them and keep them into sort of domestic sheep. I would separate young people today into two breeds. There's predators, which are the wolves, and there are the sheep, and that's most of them. And we appeal to an elite. We are, frankly, an elitist organization. We seek a few excellent people. We don't want a lot of dross. We don't want a lot of mediocre followers. What we want are people who are capable of action. Do you see a, a, a lot of... Uh you see some elements of what you're talking about in other music that's... I think the skinhead movement is a very positive step away from the decadence of the rock and drug culture that has dominated the youth so much. But as Adolf Hitler said, we seek to bring about a youth that has closed its heart to pity. All of the humanist values that Judeo-Christianity has encouraged, we want to wipe them out. It's led to democracy, social humanism, the idea of equality. All of this filth has to be wiped out if the human race is going to continue to take the next step in evolution. What do you believe that that would be like in, uh, if you were in, in control as well, far we, as your we, attitudes towards your own people? Well, we are in control because basically we are not a political organization. We are an occult organization. We are working behind the scenes to manipulate the way that people think. The war that we are waging is a guerrilla war on the human mind. And we use musical frequencies, the dominant frequency, which I've referred to before, and symbolism and imagery to awaken dormant aspects of the human mind. Isn't it difficult to, to, to get club dates and things like that, obviously, once... Well, we, we no longer are working in the context of, of that whole sphere of activities. We are moving into a much more elitist direction. We are only seeking individuals who are competent and who are willing to take action. There's a lot of people who will be an audience or a spectator, but we want people who will act. And so the Abraxas Foundation has been for some time? Or? The Abraxas Foundation is an organization that Boyd Rice and myself founded 
and it's dedicated to bringing about the values which we consider true and determined by the natural order. And in our opinion, humanity has moved away from nature and race mixing, genetic suicide, the destruction of the gene pool, all of that is completely inimical, inimical to the natural order. We need to return to order. Is this, uh, could this parallel somewhat Nietzscheism and Nietzsche? Well, Nietzsche was certainly a forerunner of our thinking because basically we're concerned with evolution, maintaining the very best of humanity and destroying destroying weakness, destroying everything that Judeo-Christianity has succored and kept alive. We have no concern for the homeless, particularly. We don't have any concern in helping people. We're not seeking to convert people. As far as I'm concerned, in 1988, this is the cutting point. Either you are with us now, or you never will be with us. What do you think about writers like, say, Oswald Spengler writing in decline I, of the West, the cycles of I, civilization? I very much believe we are now in a cycle of order. The 60s, 20 years ago, represented a cycle of decay. And since my message is directly intended for young people, I would say it's about time that young people move away from the corrupt values of the 60s, the drug culture, race mixing, equality, the, the whole chaos of that period is ending. And we're going to see a new social movement in the 90s that will make Nazism and fascism look like kindergarten. I mean, do I have to say anything else? I mean, we could all go home. He just said it all. How out in the open is that? How, how, how few people you think saw that interview? Like only had a couple hundred views on YouTube, you know? They're, that's how openly they talk amongst themselves. And if you think in a public interview they're talking that open, imagine some of the things I heard behind closed doors. Imagine some of the things Jay Parker heard in a generational bloodline family of psychopaths like that. They're very open about their agenda, folks. And, you know, they're very openly fascist and racist as well, you know. Said he wants to make Nazi Germany look like, you know, a party. Let's move to the next section because I think that speaks for itself. Symbols of Satanism. Let's look at some satanic symbolism. The first and probably the most famous is the inverted five-pointed star, also known as the pentagram. When the goat head is superimposed into or inscribed into the inverted uh, pentagram, it is known as the Baphomet pentagram. Uh, this is, of course, the main symbol of Levian Satanism. It's one of the few things I still have. Uh, I went through like this purging, this spiritual purging period where I got rid of a lot of the trappings that I had when I was involved with these organizations, but one of the few things I did keep was some jewelry. Should have brought it here today. I could have showed people in person, but I still have the official uh, ritual baphomets that I uh, got uh, in the Church of Satan. They're still in my possession. The Baphomet represents, and this is, these are the words by the uh, former high priest of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, from his uh, book, The Satanic Bible. The Baphomet represents the powers of darkness combined with the generative fertility of the goat. In its pure form, the pentagram is shown encompassing the figure of a man in the five points of the star. Three points up, two pointing down symbolizing man's spiritual nature. You know, I mean, they're so big in talking about the natural order of, you know, dog-eat-dog -dog world and the most brutal rules the roost. But here, in, in another breath, he's saying the original pentagram represented man's spiritual nature. Again, the four points being earth, air, water, and fire, and the top point, or the head, being spirit. In Satanism, the pentagram is also used, but since Satanism represents the carnal instincts of man, or in other words, man as just another animal, or the opposite of spiritual nature, the pentagram is inverted to perfectly accommodate the head of the goat, its horns representing duality thrust upwards in defiance, the other three points inverted, or the trinity 
denied. And I don't just mean, he doesn't mean that in the sense of the Trinity of God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He means that in the sense of the true Trinity of thought, emotion, and action, which they want to put down in others. Look at in control organizations such as the police where this inverted pentagram is used. The crown on top of the two horns, you know, crowning the prince of hell. Victoria police uphold the right. Trust me, they're not upholding your rights. You know, they're upholding the crown's rights, authority. Another well-known symbol of Satanism, especially when it comes to what you might call self-styled Satanists as opposed to uh, organized network Satanists, is the inverted crucifix. This is very popular in Satanic music, especially death metal and black metal. Since Satan represents the ego, which is the adversarial force preventing the emergence of Christ consciousness, many Satanists embrace the symbol of the inverted crucifix. Satanism may be seen as an ideology which is attempting to invert everything that is wholesome and good, to turn good into evil and evil into good. Thus, in the view of some Satanists, the inverted cross serves to represent this inversion of standards and morals. The hypercube is a symbol of dark occultism, not Satanism specifically, but certainly a very deeply occulted, dark occult symbol. The hypercube is one of the most occulted symbolism with all, within all dark occultism, yet it is found prevalently throughout our society in the form of octagonal symbolism. And as we'll see, the two-dimensional two projection of the hypercube, which is a representation of a four-dimensional object, is an octagon. And the octagon is one of the big satanic symbols that they use everywhere. They also use the octagon in the form of two squares overlapping each other at 90 degree angles, or the double square. You'll see that all over in control-based institutions. So in three dimensions, it appears as a cube within a cube. This is a three-dimensional depiction of the four-dimensional hypercube. It's you're rotating a cube in all of its around all of its planes, around all of its surfaces. Very difficult to conceptualize in the human imagination because we live in a 3D world, not a 4D one. Symbolically, though, the hypercube represents a never-ending prison which perpetually renews itself, or in other words, hell. So this is what a hypercube does. It folds in upon itself, then there's another cube. You know, the outside folds around it, and then there's another cube inside. And it just goes round and round and round and round. The matrix, you know? The matrix and rebooting it. So the perpetual prison is the symbol that the hypercube represents, is the concept that the hypercube represents symbolically. Here it is in the form of the double square. So the double square, this is from David Icke's book, uh, Great Researcher, uh, his book called The Biggest Secret, uh, where he describes the double square. The double square, one square on top of another in any form, is more secret society symbolism. In the secret language of symbolism, one square on top of another means control of all that is right and all that is wrong. Again, moral relativism. All that is just and all that is unjust, man's law. All that is positive and all that is negative. In other words, we control everything. And I you know, joked around about this at Free Your Mind 1 when I gave the presentation called Occult Mockery of Police and Military. Uh, when he's saying we control everything, he doesn't mean you, police. He means your owners. He means your dark occult masters who own the police. So there's the 2D projection of the hypercube in two dimensions. And you could see the outline makes the shape of the octagon, which is inside that double square. And you see this all over the symbolism of police, often put right on the head of the police, along with other dark occult symbolism, such as the Masonic floor of the house wrapped around the brain. We'll get to the occult mockery of police and military later in the presentation. One of the symbols I haven't discussed pr prior to this is one of the main symbols of Satanism, and particularly 
Levian Satanism, the trapezoid. In Satanism, the trapezoid represents the imbalanced, ego-driven consciousness and identification purely with the physical self. It is considered a perversion of the, quote, divine shape, the circle, since its angles total 360 degrees. In its satanic connotation, the trapezoid is considered a, quote, soul trap, symbolizing going around in circles of base consciousness. Levian Satanists use trapezoidal altars in many of their rituals. And where is the most predominant place symbolically that the trapezoid is found, ladies and gentlemen? There it is. There's the trapezoid. That's the satanic symbol. That's why it is the satanic part of the pyramid and all-seeing eye, not the eye part. That eye part represents divine wisdom that they are trying to block from the world. They want to be God. They don't want the light of the Creator actually coming down to the earth and, and, go, and going into the people of the earth. They want them in this prison, this trapezoid, the soul trap. So the block part of that symbol, the brick that weighs us down and keeps us absolutely rigid and unyielding and not able to, to say that we were wrong and not able to grow in consciousness and only have one unidimensional, one form thinking, to stay in that, u- that uniform and weight of brick, block-headed consciousness, okay? That's what the trapezoid represents. Let's look at some satanic numerology briefly. The number nine is Satan's number in Satanism. And I'll, I've explained why this is before. I'll briefly do it again. Here's LeVay's own words from the Satanic Rituals, the book, The Satanic Rituals. Despite others' attempts to identify a certain number, and he's referring to the number 666 here with Satan, it will be known that nine is his number. Nine is Satan's number. Nine is the number of the ego. I mean, he's telling you right here what it all represents. Nine is the number of the ego. For it always returns to itself, and he doesn't give an explanation of that. No matter what is done through the most complex multiple multiplication of nine by any other number, in the final equation, nine alone will stand forth. So, let's look at this chart on the left. One plus nine is ten. Then if we add the one and the zero from ten, you get one. So we started with one, we added nine, and then by adding the result, ten, the numbers in ten together, one and zero, we're back to one. So we started with one, we're back to one. If you take the number 2 and you add 9. You get the number 11. 1 plus 1 is 2. You started with 2, you're back to 2. It doesn't matter what number you do this with, with the number 9. It always returns to itself. Meaning, adding 9 in symbolism, in numerical symbolism known as gematria, is like adding 0. You never add anything when you add 9. And what does 9 represent? LeVay just told you. It represents the ego. Well, when you add the ego into anything, no value is added. You don't get any any increase. It stays right where it's at when ego is continued to be added. Ego changes nothing. Now let's look at the multiplication of the number 9. 9 times 1 is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. 1 plus 8 is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. 2 plus 7 is 9. 9 times 4 is 36, 3 plus 6 is 9, 9 times 5 is 45, 4 plus 5 is 9. No matter what, it doesn't matter how complex the numbers get, 9 times anything, you add the digits, it's 9. So symbolically, what does this represent? When ego, 9, is multiplied by anything, it comes right back to itself. More ego is created, and there's no change. You started with 9, you end up with 9. Okay, so what does this have to do with the other number that LeVay is talking about? Well, he says that we don't want to identify with that other number, 666, the so-called number of the beast. But if we look at Gematria, 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 18. 1 plus 8 is 9. That means in Gematria, 666 is equivalent numerologically to 9. That's why it is Satan's number, 666, 9. It's, it's an encoded you know, mathematical truth. And 
This is how occult gematria basically works to symbolize concepts. Very, you know, heady, symbolic, roundabout way of explaining a concept, but, you know, as they say, math doesn't lie. Let's look at some occult holidays, and these aren't necessarily dark occult holidays, but dark occultists also observe them. These are general occult quote-unquote holidays. There's eight of them. So the occult year is based around the zodiac and the path of the sun around the houses of the zodiac during the course of a solar year. The year is quartered by the solstices and the equinoxes, which are four of the occult holidays. These are known as the minor Sabbaths, the spring equinox, which is called Ostara, the autumn equinox, which is called Maban, the winter solstice, which is called Yule, and the summer solstice, which is simply referred to as Midsummer. At the midpoints of each season, see these the, this cross here, these lines right here, that's the solstices, summer solstice and winter solstice, and here, autumn equinox and spring equinox. These, these lines that form this cross quarter the year into seasons. So when we hit the spring equinox, spring begins. When we hit the summer solstice, summer begins. The autumn equinox begins fall, and then the winter solstice begins winter. At the midpoints, the pretty much the exact midpoints of each season that is, that is created by the quartering of the year by the solstices and equinoxes, we have four major Sabbaths, which they are known as, or occult holidays. The midpoints are considered the higher holidays, whereas those cross markers of the solstices and equinoxes are the, the minor holidays. Sorry, the, the, uh, the, the midpoints are the major holidays. So the major holidays, the midpoint of spring is the biggest one. Spring is the season of the occult. It's considered the most important season of the occult because it's the time of the year when the, when the sun renews and get, re, gives rebirth to the world by coming out of the tomb of the southern hemisphere. Yet, you know, in, in the occult world, you only had really two seasons, which was separated by this line. When the sun was in the northern hemisphere, that was the season of life, because that's the planting and growing and harvesting season. And when, you're, when the sun was in the southern hemisphere, that was the season of death. Okay? So things don't grow very well in the northern hemisphere during these seasons. This is the planting and harvesting season. The midpoint of spring is the major occult holiday. It is called Valpurgisnacht in Satanism. In general occultism, this day is mostly known as Beltane. And we'll get to why that is later. But it's May Day. Now, another tradition on Earth shares this as its highest holiday. You know what that tradition is? Communism. The high holiday of communism is May 1. May Day. 5-1. Okay? I'd suggest it's a day everybody should be very vigilant and watchful on because soon they're going to break out one of their biggest mass death rituals ever on 5-1. You know, it directly connects off-world, Area 51, Communist May Day, okay? So Valpurgis Noct means St. Valpurgis's Night who was considered in some traditions a witch. It is also known as Hexanacht. Hexanacht means the witch's night. So it's known by many different names. But that's their high holiday. And much ritual sacrifice goes on during May Day, Valpurgisnacht. The other high holidays are opposite to Valpurgisnacht or May Day in the season, in the mid, midpoint of fall, is Sowen. Pronounced Sowen, it looks like Sam Hain in English, but it's pronounced Sowen uh, in Gaelic, and that is Halloween or Hollow Mass, October 31st. Um, in the midpoint of winter, you have Candle Mass, which we just passed on February 2nd, known in the United States as Groundhog Day. You know, this is Imbolc in the uh, old Irish traditions. It's called Candle Mass in the uh, Christian and satanic tradition, February 2nd. 
The midpoint of summer is the last one that is known as Lamas Day or Lunasa. And uh, that is celebrated on August 1st. So these are the eight high holidays known as Sabbaths of the occult year. And again, the most important of them is Valpurgisnacht. And briefly, I'll tell you, that's called Beltane because the word Beltane means bell's wheel. The oldest sun god's name from the Sumerian and Babylonian tradition was Bel or Bill. And I'm going to talk about that name extensively later in the presentation. But that is why, you know, the, ma the major Sabbath of May 1st or Valpurgisnacht, also known as Beltane, is considered the highest um, occult holiday. It is the holiday after whom the sun god Bill or Bell was named. And it means Bell's wheel, meaning the zodiacal wheel of the year. Let's look at some dark occult rituals. And I'll talk about just the general types of rituals that Satanists conduct, but they're not really that exciting. You know, not as exciting or dramatic as you might think. The big rituals are the ones that we don't even look at as rituals, you know. In the branch of Satanism with which I was involved, rituals were essentially viewed as psychodramatic gatherings of sympathetic energy. I know that's a big mouthful there. But in other words, it's almost like play acting, where you're gathering energy and you're trying to direct energy. You're channeling energy. And you're, you're trying to focus it and use it for a, per, a particular purpose or goal. This energy could then be harnessed and directed toward a given cause or goal. Rituals were referred to in Satanism as magical ceremonies, as most Satanists accept the concept of, quote, magic as a means of influencing change to occur in accordance with their will. Now, I've talked about the difference between magic and sorcery in my work, and they both have the same definition, the ability to influence change to occur in accordance with the will. What makes it magic and what makes it sorcery? Well, real high magic is aligning your will with the will of creation, which is the evolution of consciousness. Then it's magic if you're influencing change to, ha to happen for that reason. If you're doing it for your own selfish purposes, your own lower case W will, then that's sorcery. So Satanists basically conduct sorcery. They call it magical ceremonies, but they're sorcer sorcery ceremonies. Rituals in Levian Satanism were divided into three basic categories. And again, you could read all about them in their book, The Satanic Rituals. Compassion, destruction, and sex rituals. Compassion rituals are held to influence agendas in favor of the grotto's desires or the desires of the wider satanic network. So if you have a goal you're looking, the whole group is looking to advance, you might come together and do what they call a compassion ritual which is focusing the energy toward the accomplishment of that goal. And they do this by chanting, burning incense, lighting candles, holding play acting, uh, you know, summoning different uh, names uh, to, to project you know, vocalization of energy. Um, and they hold things called ceremonial masses. But essentially they're play acting psychodramatic rituals to gather and focus the energy of the people involved so that they ultimately work harder to bring that desired result into physical manifestation. It's about entrainment. It's about putting everybody on the same, working toward the same group goal. You know, you're, they create what they call a mastermind, a group of people all focused on the, on the attainment of the same task. They're very, very organized and on the same page in this regard. And I've talked about in my work how humanity is not. Everybody wants a million different things, but they don't want to end slavery on the earth. You know, they don't want to understand rights and then actually protect their rights. You know, they're all living for all these different purposes of hedonistic pleasure pursuits, but we don't come together for the right reasons. These people all come together and act of one accord for all the wrong reasons. That's why the universe is technically granting them what they want. 
because the universe will grant the desires of what people want if they all come together and none of them are divided. And not only that, but they're not divided inside internally about what they want. In other words, their thoughts, their emotions, and their actions are perfectly in alignment. There's no contradiction. They don't say they want this and then their emotions and, and actions betray what they say they want in their thoughts. They're very unified in that regard. I call this concept dark care. People hate it. They hate hearing about it because it's like saying, what, evil can win over good? Yes. Yes, it can. Evil is winning over good. Not only can it, it is. Because they're united and on one accord and we are not. That's exactly why evil's winning right now, unfortunately. So when they come together and do these rituals, they're on the same page. They're all there for the same reason. Destruction rituals are the opposite. They're held to direct etheric energy toward individual or group enemies, meaning anyone who stands in the way of their plans. And then they direct that energy and they send, they send it out. And, you know, then I could almost guarantee if the person's powerful enough in their ability to do something to them, they don't just send it energetically. They go and take care of them. Sex rituals are held for forming familial bonds between members of the group or to influence such bonds with outsiders who could be used to advance the Satanist goals. Such rituals as you might see in uh, Eyes Wide Shut. I just want to say for the record, I never personally attended any rituals in the form of Satanism I was involved in that involved conjurations of non-human entities. Most of the Satanists there never even talked about any of that kind of stuff. They were not into trying to summon forth entities or demons. I'm not denying that that goes on, but not in the branch or form of Satanism I was personally involved with. Nor did I attend any ceremonies involving any type of non-consensual sexual activity or sexual activity with minors. I do not deny that such rites do occur, because they do. But they did not occur at my level of involvement with dark occultism. Here's the real kind of rituals that go on that are satanic rituals that are performed every single day and people don't even look at them as rituals. And they don't look at the places that they are performed as temples or churches of the dark occult. Political rituals. We're going to sign our law into being that we're going to forcibly coerce man to live by. You know, we're going to do it in our temple on the, cap on the Capitol Hill. Capital Line Hill, because we're the gods of this society. You know, all kinds of magical rites and rituals are done every time these politicians try to pass off anything to the public. They have to do little tricks, you know, and little rituals to get people to say, oh, isn't that nice? Look at, look at how elaborate and nice that was. They don't even realize that's a church. That's a, that's a dark occult congregation of men who want to be God on earth. Is exactly what you're looking at there. How about this ritual that goes on every second of the day on earth? The slaughter of other sentient beings. This is mass blood sacrifice every single second of the day on earth. The altar of sacrifice runs with blood continuously. And you know what? Not just with animals. They do it with children. They do it with people in war. You know, getting the herd to call itself. And we're going to traumatize people so that they grow up doing the same thing when they get older, as Jay has talked about. Trauma-based mind control is another big ritual. You know, creating altars in the mind through, through torture. Fritz Springmeier extensively exposed this in his book, How the Illuminati Create an Undetectable Mind Control Slave. Project Monarch. See, that's what all this sexual abuse, pedophilia of the young is all about. It's about fracturing the mind of these children so that, that altars get created. And then they can control them. They can program that impressionable mind because it's fractured. And it's like a blank computer hard drive that then can then be given instruction. 
Trauma-Based Mind Control. Another book you should definitely check out about this is Kathy O'Brien's Transformation of America, and you could hear her speak at Free Your Mind 4 as well. How about circumcision as one of the big trauma-based mind control rituals that's going on every day throughout the world? Mutilate, and not just male circumcision, female circumcision too. The mutilation of the genitalia of babies going on all the time in our society. And people still think this is for health reasons. I mean, please. You know, we jack up our babies with vaccines like Jay was talking about earlier, and then we mutilate their genitals. And we don't think this is totally traumatic and a form of mind control and a form of satanic ritual. Well, you know, you need to pay attention to Janice Barcelo's work on this. It's disgusting. As I said, war, modern human sacrifice. That's all this is. It's all war has ever been. And people do it for king and country, you know? So many people think it's so honorable to go into the armed services, to go and join standing armies. It's a death cult. It, they, these people have always been members of the big death cult. Get as offended as you want. That's the truth. And they need to see it, and other people need to stop sugarcoating it and tell them to their face, you're involved in a cult that you know nothing about at all. You don't know anything about the operators of the cult you're involved in. And you think you're doing good? You think you're doing something that is necessary for humanity? It, it's, it's a childish joke mindset. I'll look into the face of a military person and say that right to their face. Because they weren't where I was at. They don't know what I know. They don't know where I've been. They don't know what I've seen. Okay? I'm not, telling, I'm not asking people to believe a damn thing. You know? And, and, and it's, it's, it's very much similar. It's actually a similar situation to being in war. And not being able to explain what it's like to people. You know, that's why I could wholly identify with, with Jay. While I never experienced anything like what he went through, trying to explain that mindset to someone who's never gone through it or been in that, that, the, the circle of that, those kind of people is a near impossibility. You were either there and you experienced it or you don't really get it. I'm not saying that to berate anybody and say that you, know, you can't understand what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's like how people in war share some sort of a bond you know, because they were both there. It's the same thing with people who are involved in something like this. You can't really fully, deeply explain it to another human being. Either you were there or you weren't. That's why it's the, doing this type of work from the, the perspective of a former insider is so difficult. Let's look at some rituals that take place at the Bohemian Grove. Now here is a very good example of some of this psychodrama that I'm talking about. Play acting. You know, and they take up all the roles, male and female, because there's no women allowed there. You know, um, a lot of heterosexual stuff goes on there. You know, many even former presidents have attested to that. They bring a lot of male prostitutes in there to service the politicians and also compromise them, bringing very very young men into there and uh, compromise pol politicians and other people in influential positions of power in society with uh, sexual rights with minors and then you know get pictures of them there doing those acts and, and then they own them for the rest of their lives. You know, that's one of the ways that they use a lot of these, uh, these uh, retreats to um, bring people into their fold and keep them there. But uh, in these old pictures that uh, I believe some woman had from her father who was a member you know, she brought them out of his closet when he passed and, you know, scanned them all. There are hundreds of pictures of Bohemian Grove from the uh, early 1900s. One of the things that, besides the psychodrama rituals, are rituals directly involving death. They're very big into this. That's why they call these cults the cults of death, the cult of death. I mean, that's one of the names that this dark... Atonist cult is referred to as simply as the cult of death. 
I call it the cult of the black sun, as some other researchers do. Because ultimately that's what they worship, the dark side of the sun, the dark side of the light, the dark side of knowledge. Um, I mean, you see that they clearly go through some very strange rituals of, uh, you know, death and rebirth. Um, you know, this hanging ritual here. I, I can't claim to understand it. I, I was never involved at Bohemian Grove, but I'm telling you, the things that they're involved in, they look deranged, and it's just not normal behavior. This isn't just like, you know, some fraternity thing that, you know, some... some uh, a college fraternity is doing. These are the power brokers of the world engaged in this stuff. Of course, the big ritual at Bohemian Grove is known as the cremation of care. The cremation of care. And just think about the name of it. We're going to immolate, burn to ashes, the dynamic of care in the world. You know, all the power brokers of the world who have to unite on this globalist agenda coming into this big power broker club for two weeks of the year, performing, you know, who knows what twisted, deviant, heterosexual sex rights that they do, okay? Making deals behind the scenes, politicians attend it, people in military, law enforcement, you name it, attend it, and then they culminate this at midsummer, the summer solstice, okay, one of the Sabbaths of the occult year, with the ritual called the cremation of care, which they get together and they burn allegedly in effigy, and I do believe it is just an effigy, because there are other rites taking place away from this. This is about the focus of this energy, so then the real rituals that are taking place in other areas of this forest are actually sucking the energy from this focal point of the cremation of care. All of these people are there to say one thing. We are burning our conscience away because we are going to be asked to do things during the course of the year that are going to be harmful and disastrous to other people. And we have to continuously renew our resolve. And not just that, we have to forgive ourselves for what we are about to do. This is known as a reverse absolution ritual. In other words, I'm going to forgive myself now for the harm I'm going to visit upon someone tomorrow. And that's what these twisted bastards believe. That's what this ritual is all about. Um, Probably the clearest photo ever taken of the cremation of care ritual at Bohemian Grove brought forward by, again, someone who uh, was an, a family member of a person who was actually involved. Uh, the photo on the left was taken from Alex Jones's infiltration of Bohemian Grove uh, about a decade ago. Here's the biggest satanic rituals that are ever conducted. You know, people want to talk about rituals conducted in some uh, McMansion uh, on the uh, Pennsylvania-Maryland border, you know, in someone's home. That's nothing. These are the real rituals. These are the real satanic rituals, folks. Not what Anton LaVey wrote about in the book, The Satanic Rituals. False flags are mega rituals, rituals of manifestation, where these dark occultists are bringing out a problem, reaction, solution event to get what they want. To get the public to give them what they want. They don't even have to take it by force when they conduct these rites. You know, and people are still fooled. They're still fooled by them. The Gulf of Tonkin never happened. And we're still fooled by these so-called shootings that are happening. Some of them without even victims, without provable bodies or victims. You know? And the, the, their solution is to take people's ability to defend themselves with firearms away. Because so what? You put some psychopathic, mind-controlled monarch, slave, up to shooting some people? So you're going to take my gun so I can't defend myself from the big cult? I don't think so. Not while I'm breathing. These are the big rituals of the world, folks. And people need to start talking about them as rituals 
as death rituals, because that's what they are. And here's the time to watch for them. It's something that you, myself and other researchers have brought forward and explained to people, this is the time period they do this stuff. They love this time period. They'll do it any time of the year. But I'm telling you, they love the, 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 from the spring equinox to May Day. This is their preferred time for blood sacrifice, and there's a reason for it. On the third day after the spring equinox, the sun breaks past the equatorial line, the equator, and it fully emerges from its, quote, tomb of the southern hemisphere, as we talked about, the season of death when the sun is in the southern hemisphere and the season of life when it is in the northern hemisphere. This represents the sun, quote, rising from the dead, Christ rising from the tomb, to begin its journey toward its highest power at the summer solstice, when they do their cremation of care ritual on midsummer. In sun-worshipping traditions of the past, animal sacrifice and sometimes human sacrifices were offered during the 40 days between the spring equinox and May Day, mid-spring. This is the planting season of the year, and the sacrifices were made to the sun and earth, who were viewed as great spirits, to ensure a bountiful food harvest. The 40 days between March 22nd and May 1st are known as the occult season of sacrifice. 40 days is a significant time period in biblical and occult terms. Be particularly vigilant for false flag mega ritual, mega death ritual events during these, this time, this 40 day period. And they are human sacrifice rituals. That's exactly what they are. So the number 322, March 22nd, that's the beginning of the season of sacrifice. The cult of death, known as Skull and Bones, uses that number. It's a funny anecdotal story. When I gave the natural law seminar in New Haven, Connecticut, when Art put us up in the hotel, he didn't even know it. We had room 322 at the hotel where I stayed. And you know, hey, that's where Skull and Bones is at. It was almost like they were saying, hi, Mark. Thanks for coming. So this is the time period really to watch for blood sacrifice rituals, mass blood rituals. Look at how many have occurred only in the last couple hundred years. The battles of Lexington and Concord, the British attacked Lexington and Concord, April 19, 1775. And while they slaughtered many of our men at Lexington, we handed them their ass at Concord. The Baltimore riots, 13 killed, April 19th, 1861. The sinking of the Titanic, 1,512 deaths, April 14th and 15th, 1912. Assassination of Martin Luther King, April 4th, 1968. The Waco massacre, April 19th, the anniversary of Lexington and Concord, 1993. The Oklahoma City bombing, same day, April 19th, Battle of Lexington and Concord Anniversary, 1995. Port Arthur, Australia Massacre, April 28th, 96. Heaven's Gate cult suicides, March 26th, 1997. West Side Middle School Massacre in Arkansas, March 24th, 1998. Columbine High School school shootings, mass shooting ritual, April 20th, Hitler's birthday, 1999. Iraq War, the beginning of the Iraq War, shock and awe bombings, March 19th. Okay, that's technically the, the spring equinox, 2003. It's the day, day I was appointed priest in the Church of Satan. That's the day LeVay did all of his appointments, March 19th. Virginia Tech School Shooting Massacre, April 16th, 2007. The Moscow Metro bombings, March 29th, 2010. The BP oil spill began April 20th, 2010, Hitler's birthday. Libya was invaded on March 19th, 2011. The Boston Marathon bombing, April 15th, 2013. It's just coincidence. Watch this time period. Occultists kill a lot of people during that time period because of their sick, twisted belief system. Let's look at some dark occult variants and groups. I could call this section who really rules the world. 
Again, you have these public interface groups like the Church of Satan, which was run by Anton LaVey. Now I believe P Peter Gilmore is the high priest of the Church of Satan right now. You had groups like the Temple of Set, run by Michael Aquino, who became a general in the, arm, in the army, the U.S. Army. He ran the PSYOPs division of the army, psychological operations, psychological warfare ops. Michael Aquino, Satanist, who considers himself a Setianist as opposed to a, simply a Satanist. Set was the dark solar deity of ancient Egypt who um, was the adversarial force who opposed the good solar deity Horus, who was about morality, and Set was about immorality. They patterned themselves after these dark gods, you know, because that's who they fashioned themselves after. Some other groups that I was personally involved with, I was never a member of the Temple of Set, but I had friendships with many people who were involved directly in the Temple of Set. Um, I was involved with an organization called the Order of the Evil Eye in Florida. And that's a lower level interface group like the Church of Satan. Also, there's a, or was, I'm not sure if it's still in operation, a group in Whitehall, Pennsylvania, known as the Whitehall Church of Satan. And um, that group, uh, this is this um, pamphlet here, called Satanic Rites and Ceremonies uh, with a slightly different variant of the Baphomet on the cover of that book. This was um, an organization that was dedicated to human androgyny, to the androgenization of society in order to make, in order to destroy the, the established gender uh, identification of male and female so that people would be easier to rule. This is also a eugenics operation, not to belabor this, because I'm going to talk about it extensively at Free Your Mind. When you lower testosterone levels in a society, not only do um, people become androgenized, sex drives are lowered. So this is a form of calling the population. Not only male sex drive is lowered, but female sex drive gets lowered when testosterone levels are not at the proper optimum levels. Many people don't know that and think testosterone is something that is only in in the male of our species, and it is not. It is critical for testosterone levels to be at a certain level for uh, feminine sexuality to be normal. And there is a war against this chemical in the human body. There is a war on testosterone as surely as there is a war on cannabis. More so. Okay? Because they want an androgenized population that isn't reproducing itself and certainly isn't standing up for itself because Testosterone is also the war chemical. You know, it's the chemical that's going to let you say the lost word. No. Right. You know, because you're not going to take other people's bullshit. You're going to stand up for yourself and your rights when your testosterone levels are normal. They want a docile population, and they're doing that by eradicating testosterone in the population. I'll be getting into it more at Free Your Mind 4. Every mystery tradition has its inversion. See, this is the dual-edged nature of the occult world. In this section, I don't want you to think I'm saying that these traditions are bad, because I covered them briefly, not nearly extensively, in Demystifying the Occult Part 1. I, we talked about Freemasonry. We talked about Rosicrucianism. We talked about Kabbalah. Okay. These traditions are rich in symbolism and they're rich in knowledge of self. They can help people really to deeply understand morality and natural law. I highly encourage people to look into all of these traditions. You don't need to go into any organizations or groups. You know, you have the truth device right here and right here in the palm of your hand if you use it the right way. You know, you don't need to go and take oaths to any organization or group to acquire knowledge of this order, you know. So please hear what I'm saying and don't think about this unidimensionally that I'm saying any of, these, any of these traditions are in and of themselves inherently bad. Again, knowledge is capable of being perverted and used for the wrong reasons. So is there such a thing as light Freemasonry and dark Freemasonry? Yes, there is. Is there such a thing as light Kabbalah and dark Kabbalah? Yes, there is. Is there such a thing as light Rosicrucianism and dark Rosicrucianism? Yes, there is. It all depends on the consciousness of the person wielding the knowledge. So, 
We have to understand the mystery schools have, have been fallen for countless generations. These traditions were originally set up and intended to teach people and convey to them symbolically and allegorically the knowledge of natural law and the knowledge of self and the laws of the universe. They have fallen, they're corrupt like every other institution on the face of the earth, and they're chock full of dark occultists, which is why I don't really encourage people to go into lodge systems. I encourage individual study. Or if you have a lot of people that you know you could put together and form a lodge or you know go and you know infiltrate a lodge, good luck to you. You know, I know people who have tried to turn lodges around and it ain't happening. Folks. You're in the White Lodge. This is it. Welcome. Thank you for arriving. You know? Here's the thing. Form your own. You know? do, do that work yourself as well. Carry the information to others who need to see and hear and understand it. That's what the propagation of the, white, the true White Lodge is all about. You know, people say, Mark, where's the, all the, the good aspects of this tradition? Where's the, the positive lodges? I'm like, hey, take a look around. <laughs> You're there. You found it. Congratulations. You know? So, uh, you know, I call dark Freemasonry, I just call it dark masonry. I don't even refer to it as Freemasonry. I look at true Freemasonry as Freemasonry. It's about building freedom. Then there's the dark builders, you know? And they're not working toward building a society based in freedom. A lot of the founding fathers were Freemasons. You know, I consider them certainly of the light variety. Um, Kabbalah, powerful, powerful tradi tradition uh, about the reception of natural law. And that's what it means, reception. It is about the reception of the divine light. Is there a negative aspect of it? Yes, there is. It's called klipot, Klip klipotic. Kabbalah. Look up the Klipot. It's spelled Q-L-I-P-P-O-T-H. Sick stuff. Satanic stuff. It's derived from the same knowledge. Just psychopaths and lunatics took it and used it to their ends. So every tradition that has a light side is capable of falling and having a dark side. Higher level dark occult organizations, we already briefly talked about these guys. The Order of Skull and Bones, known as the Order of Death at Yale, up in New Haven. So many, you know, people in intelligence agencies, you know, get tapped through Skull and Bones, because they're another big part of the cult system, is world, the worldwide network of occult, uh, I'm sorry, of intelligence orders. Um, Bohemian Club, you know, where the power brokers meet yearly. You got to look into all these groups and understand the people who are affiliated with them. Political and financial organizations. Jay talked about the Bank of International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks. You want to talk about some an organization that's, that's packed with dark occultists. There it is. And uh, they, I believe they operate out of Switzerland. The Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the UN, the Federal Reserve System, worldwide communism and worldwide Nazism. And let me tell you something, folks. You think that these ideologies have anywhere near been defeated or taken care of in the world. You're out of your damn mind. Because they are so on the rise, communism and Nazism are in total control in this country. And I'm telling you, neo-Nazism is big time on the rise. Not only here, but in Europe, heavily. You know, some of the people involved in these political and financial organizations, the Rothschilds, especially Jacob and David. You know, here's the Bush family. You know, former Baron Rothschild, the Rockefellers, David Rockefeller. The whole cult of Saturn the black-robed cult of Saturn, the judiciary class. You know, here's a Satanist that I actually saw at a ritual, Alan Greenspan, former director of the Federal Reserve System. You know, these are people who are all involved in this dark cult. 
They're involved in it at high levels. They're making policy decisions. They're shaping how money operates in the world. They own the monetary system. They own politics. They own the banks. They own the courts. They own it all. It's all their inventions. They invented this whole system. We didn't invent this system to enslave ourselves. This big cult did. Thousands of years before any of us were born. Tens of thousands. High-level think tanks and intelligence agencies, you know? And there's, they're endless. You know, I, I got so depressed making this presentation, folks, and I don't mean that... I know this is all heavy stuff. I'm actually going to end with some humor later so as not to, you know, make it a, a total, you know, sledgehammer. Um, but I got depressed making this because I'm, I'm myself realizing, and, you know, me and Jay have had discussions about this, you know, some heavy discussions, some lighthearted ones, about how many people are involved in this cult. You know, when Jay throws the numbers out there, I'm like, dude, you're out of your mind. You think that many people are involved. There's nowhere near that many people involved. And when I'm doing the research for this presentation, I'm starting to realize maybe there are as many as people, as he's saying, who are involved. You know, his, his numbers are 10 to 12 percent of the human population. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I hear that number and I just want to like melt into a puddle. You know, it's like if it's that much, we're, we're in a lot of trouble, people. So, you know, the number one percent that people throw around, you know, I think it's almost hopeful because look at how many people are involved. Look at how many groups, how many people, all their ancillary supporters and members. People are involved in this cult at low levels, but there's many of them in the low level areas of it. Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, the NSA, the NRO, whose symbolism, whose dark occult symbolism I broke down in my first Demystifying the Occult seminar. The CIA, the Club of Rome, the big eugenics arm of the operation. You want to talk about who's directing the eugenics and epi-eugenics agendas? You need to look no further than the Club of Rome. CIA, NASA, and of course our friends at the Bilderberg Group, you know, who comprise high-level high power brokers in just every, every area. You know, media, education, finance, entertainment, politics, etc. Technology even. The so-called royal bloodlines, and I put royal in quotes because there is no such thing as royalty. Royalty is absolute nonsense. Nobody's special because they have special blood. If you believe that, you know, you're in the satanic mindset. You know, nobody's genes are special and grants them the right to rule over other people. So it's hard to believe how many people still accept this and how many royal families there still are in the world. All over Europe there's ruling royal families. And people say, oh yeah, they're just figureheads. They're just figureheads. Queen of England's estimated net worth is $17.5 trillion. It's just a figurehead. You, there's no power in that kind of money. There's no power in that kind of wealth. It's not like you can buy politicians with $17.5 trillion. I mean, come on. I mean, then people actually believe that nonsense. You know? These people are people who think they're God. That's the only thing that makes them quote-unquote royal. You think you have some divine right that you don't. They're jokes. They're inbred, mentally deranged jokes. I'm, 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 say, I'm directly saying that. Me, Mark Passio, is saying that to all the royalty of Europe. You're insane, mentally deranged, psychopathic, parasitic, inbred jokes. And here's some more bad jokes that people still believe in. Religion, you know? You want to talk about who's at the top of a satanic hierarchy? Religion. You want to, people say the world's run from Washington, D.C., London, Moscow, Beijing, and Tokyo. Bullshit. You want to know where the world's run from? Rome, Israel, and Mecca. That's where the world's run from, folks. 
Rome, Israel, and Mecca. You better know that. And we think these are our religions. They invented these religions. The dark occult invented these religions in the ancient world. They are the astrotheological cults. The sun, the moon, and the stars. It's right in their symbols that they are the cults of the ancient world. The solar cult, the, the lunar cult, and the, and, the, and the stellar cult. It's right in the symbol of the religion. And people still can't see it. You know, you got to look into some of the other occult orders that are hidden within some of these religions. You know, like Opus Dei, like the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, you know, depicted here by the Black Pope, you know. And, you know, deeper level Talmudic and Zionist Judaic organizations, you know, so-called Jews that would be called crypto-Jews. Religion is not what it appears to be, folks. It's a mask. It's a mask on a demonic face. And people better start waking up to that fact and realizing it. These religions are not on the side of humanity. They were created by these cults of the ancient world. And they are run by dark occultists to keep people inactive and believing that some savior is coming to rescue us from ourselves. There ain't nobody coming to help us. We got to do this work ourselves. I don't care what force you want to believe in for strength. I'm not telling you don't have that belief. But you know what? You got to do the action. God helps those who help themselves. Here's one of the new big religions that's owned by the dark occult. I told people how Satanists and dark occultists ghostwrite the New Age books. They put useful dupes up to write them and throw their name on it. They, they give them all the conceptual ideas of solipsism and moral relativism and the bullshit notion of the law of attraction instead of teaching them natural law. Ain't one New Age teacher I know teaching anybody natural law. Not one. Zero. Total number. Zero. You know, where's the New Age teachers talking about the laws of morality that, are, that give us the real experiential results that we experience in our lives based on our behavior. There's not one New Age teacher talking about that. None. No, but they'll, they'll sell us a million different products at the New Age Expo, you know, and they'll try to take the emphasis off of knowledge. That's what the New Age is designed to do. It's solipsism, folks, pure and simple. It's the big third satanic sin that the Satanists are trying to pass off to the rest of the population. Now, a lot of people talk about Luciferianism. and How does this differ from, from Satanism? Well, Luciferianism, first and foremost, is not one thing. Once again, is Freemasonry one thing? No, it is not. Is Kabbalah one thing? No, it is not. Is Rosicrucianism one thing? No, it is not. Nor is Luciferianism. There is a dark side of it and a light side to it. So let's just talk about the name, where the name Lucifer derives from. The name Lucifer is derived from the Latin noun lux, meaning light. Again, this is all about vision, light, the ability to see. The ability to see light from darkness. The second part of the word Lucifer is derived from the Latin verb ferre, which means to bring or to carry, to ferry something. Therefore, in its pure form, again, like the original upright pointing pentagram, in its pure form represented the spiritual nature of mankind. Well, in its pure form, all Lucifer means, it is the conceptual idea of the force through which the light, divine knowledge, natural law, is conveyed to human beings. Hence, that's why the all-seeing eye has been used as a representational symbol of the light of the creator and the bringer of the light from the creator to human beings called Lucifer. Okay? The, the words fiat lux are often used in conjunction with this all-seeing eye to mean let there be light. 
the first words attributed to the creation of the universe by the Creator. The true self, divine wisdom, enlightenment, or Christ consciousness is the result of the full intake of this high-level knowledge of self, nature, spirit, and creation. That is what Lucifer is in its pure form, folks. So, I'm here to tell everyone completely unapologetically today, I am a Luciferian. Surprise, surprise. Am I a dark Luciferian? No. I identify with the symbol of Lucifer as the conveyor of divine light or knowledge. That's all. It's a symbol. It's just like to a Satanist, Satan is a symbol of the ego run amok that takes over the being and wants them to control everything. And they identify with that force, the ego, and elevate it to the position of godhood in their religion. Well, all Lucifer means to me is it's the light of the Creator that we are capable of receiving if we open our mind and heart to it. That's it. I don't care whether you have this notion stuck in your head that it's a bad, evil thing. You go right ahead. You want to believe that? You believe that. I can see it in a different aspect because I don't have one-dimensional thinking about a symbolic concept. If you do, I'd say, you know, you're, cutting, you're selling yourself short and you're not conceptually able to understand symbolically what that symbol means. Now, does that mean there aren't dark Luciferians? No, because there most certainly are. And that's who's running the world at the highest levels. So I would look at myself as a light Luciferian or a positive Luciferian, however you want to look at it, a pure Luciferian, as the enemy of these people, as the opponent Let's not even use the word enemy. As they are, they are the people who really have the knowledge of how natural law works. They look at them as and, and want to teach people how it works so that they can actually work in conjunction with it, with the real laws of attraction and create a better world. They look at, the dark Luciferians look at us as their mortal opponents, as their mortal enemies and opponents in this game for, you know, human freedom. Dark Luciferian is the perversion of the conveyance of that spiritual knowledge that we talked about. Dark Luciferians would be considered a superclass of the worldwide satanic network who hold even higher level knowledge about how natural law really works, which many Satanists do not even hold. The Luciferians are ultimately who are throwing, going to throw the Satanists under the bus. When Jay talks about the quote-unquote rank-and-file Illuminati, those are the Satanists. The super high-class so-called illuminated ones, the darkly illuminated ones, these dark Luciferians, that's who's going to throw them under the bus. Because not every they're, they're, they don't want to share that power. They want it for themselves. They know how natural law really works, and yet they have rejected the reality of it in favor of attempting to, quote, reign in hell rather than serve in heaven. These dark occult elitists are ultimately those who have been controlling humanity through exploitation of occult knowledge for tens of thousands of years. This deranged and parasitic ideology could also be referred to as dark atonism. Again, I don't simply call it the cult of Aton or the Aten, because the Aten was just the light. Again, the light in its pure form in ancient Egypt was called the Aten, or the Aton. Well, there was three aspects to the Aton. The one that was rising on the eastern horizon, which was called Horus, the Horus aspect. The one that was setting on the western horizon, was, which was called the Set aspect, the dark sun, and Amun-Ra, the sun at noon, at its apex, at its highest point of light, which is why prayers are offered to Amen. Amen. Aten had three forms. You know, Horus and, and Amen Ra are positive aspects. Set means the light's going out. Knowledge is being perverted. The Christ consciousness is being conquered and put into the underworld, where it has to do battle and then rise again on the eastern horizon. All the same sun, it's all the same light, it's all the same knowledge. It's how it's used. So I call it dark atonism to make the 
the distinction. Setianism, which is a very valid word for it because Set was just the dark god, or the cult of the black sun. We'll look at some of these symbols, but this is where the idea of the fallen angel of heaven, God's angel who was the most like him, fell. That's the divine wisdom being used for the wrong purposes, dark Luciferianism. This is their symbol. There's the light, Lucifer. And here's what they want to create, the dark new world order, Novus Ordo Seclorum. He favors our work. Yeah, dark, the dark God. The dark Lucifer favors the work of blocking out the light from the world and completing the, the male dominator violence and coercion and slavery-based dark new world order. That's who favors that great work. Dark Luciferian symbolism, the owl. The owl is a predatory bird who can see its prey at night and fly above its prey when its prey is inca incapable of seeing it. It has night vision. It can see. It can see even in the dark. The illuminated torch, another Luciferian symbol. And again, on the Statue of Liberty, I see it as the positive aspect of Lucifer. I believe the Statue of Liberty was given in good faith by French Freemasons as a symbol of liberty. And she holds a book with the date July 4th, 1776. You know, that symbol's a very positive symbol to me as far as I'm concerned. That's the light of knowledge, the knowledge of the Creator, divine wisdom. However, dark Luciferians use it as a symbol that they are the holders of that flame. They are the holders of that light. They will do with it as they see fit. Here's some of them. You want to know who the dark Luciferians are? Oh, somebody got some good shots of them at Bohemian Grove. Here they are before like a 50-foot Buddha statue, and they're burning some kind of an animal sacrifice on this altar here. And they're all in white robes. You know, not like the Satanists in dark robes. You know, they concern, that's the Illuminati. These are Illuminati members of, of the early 1900s, folks. That's what they look like. And you'll notice they're not all white men. They're not all white men. They're from every continent on the earth. That's the other thing I want to take a minute and talk about. People think, oh, it's, this is all just rich white men in this cult. Yeah, that's what you think. Let me tell you something. There's people from every race, ostensible religion, background, economic class, gender. It doesn't make a difference. There's people from all over involved in this cult. It has nothing to do with a particular type of person. Okay? And you could just look at all their faces and you could see they're from every, they're, every continent of the world is represented by that priest class. I think people should definitely look at these photos more in depth. I'm going to get to a couple of them, a couple more of them later. But this is another one of the dark Luciferian symbols, and I think this is the symbol of the whole worldwide dark cult, the cult of the black sun. You know, this was the symbol that the secret society within a secret society in Nazi Germany used. It was referred to as Die Schwarz Sun, the black sun, and that's. That was the occult order that ran the SS, which ultimately ran Nazi Germany. And Himmler was obsessed with dark occultism. And uh, Michael Aquino, member of the Setian Temple of Set, you know, other identified dark Luciferian organization, brags about how he has artifacts from Himmler, you know, that was, were used at Vivelsburg and he used them in ritual, you know. Because that's another thing, eugenics, um, fascism are huge in the dark occult world. That's what they want. And you heard Nicholas Schreck when he was involved with the, the Church of Satan and Temple of Set in that interview, tell people we are in control and we're going to build a world that is where young people are absolutely devoid of mercy for their fellow human beings, and we're going, to make, we're going to create a fascist world order that's going to make Nazi Germany look like a little girl's tea party. Yep. 
And of course, Setinism is a big part of this. Again, the dark solar deity of ancient Egypt that does battle with Horus, the light side of the sun. He is identified with the black sun. That's what this cult is. It's the cult of the black sun. I don't care what name you want to call it. They're the cult of the dark side of light. The dark side of knowledge. So how do these dark occultists avoid the brunt of karmic consequence that naturally should be visited down upon them according to the moral laws of creation, natural law? How do they get away with what they're doing? And they are getting away with it. They do get away with it to a large extent. I will not say completely, but they definitely do not take the brunt of the consequence. In other words, like if we were going to like ram into a building with a big tank, you know, and a whole bunch of people in the front were going to have to take the brunt of that force and probably get killed, okay? Well, they're way in the back, okay? But they're driving the tank, okay? They're getting other people to take the brunt of that consequence for them. And it's because they know how natural law works. These people consciously know that what they're doing is wrong. They know the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior at the highest levels. They don't think it's relative. They even pass the notion of moral relativism down to their adherence of their religion. That's how they form a cult based on an erroneous belief system. A cult is a religion that's based on an erroneous belief system whose membership does harm to people that don't subscribe to that religion. It's the definition of a cult. The dark Luciferians at the highest level of the dark occult know the difference between right and wrong behavior. That right behavior is moral because it is in alignment with natural law and actions that are based in, that are rights, don't cause harm, don't result in harm to other sentient beings, period. That's what a right is, an action that does not cause harm to another sentient being. And they know that wrongdoing is in opposition to moral law, in opposition to natural law, and that it does result in harm to other sentient beings. They know this. They have rejected natural law. They have rejected all of its expressions. They know that they can only build chaos and control and slavery by using the dynamic of fear and ignorance in society. But they have chosen in their absolute willful disregard for natural law to create a prison within creation and rule the prison. And this is because they so want to be able to do whatever they want unchecked. This is how crazed the ego is. In other words, they know there is a moral consequence in nature for doing harm to others that cannot be avoided. Karma is real, it operates, and it cannot be avoided in nature. That's why, that's why we're experiencing the slavery we're experiencing, experiencing now. Because karmically, in the aggregate, not just as individuals, but in the aggregate of our society, we've collectively made more immoral choices than moral choices. They know how this dynamic works individually and societally. And they hate it so much that they have said, F off to the creator of the universe. We will not accept that we are bound by that law. So we are going to create a pocket of the universe within it, and we are going to turn natural law on its head. We are going to be the creators of law, and we are going to subjugate people to that law and become God in this little pocket that we've created, this pocket of ignorance that we've created, and we're going to rule that little dungeon. We're going to rule that little pocket of creation. That's what earth is. That's what the earth is, because we've let these people rule it. So that's their worldview. Their worldview is that because they cannot do whatever they want unchallenged, that the entire universe, since this universal law is in place and they know it's in place, their worldview is that the entire universe is a prison for them. And so they rail and rage against that and say, no, maybe it is a prison for us, but we are going to become gods within a little corner of the prison. It's like people who are in a prison on earth who then start like their little 
gangs within the prison. And like, you know, I run this aspect of the prison. Like, you know, you're not going to run any drugs through this prison because I run that. So they take over a little corner of the prison or an aspect of the prison. Well, that's the same way these dark occultists work. They've rejected that there is a higher law in creation, even though they know there is. They so don't want to be bound by it that they have chosen willfully to, through confusion and through keeping other people in ignorance of those laws, to try to become God within a little pocket of what they consider a prison. Now, that's an erroneous worldview. The world is not a prison. The universe is not a prison. Well, the earth is now a prison because of the choices we've made and the ignorance we've been kept in. But it doesn't have to be. The universe is not a prison because it is governed according to law. The universe is a paradise because it is governed according to law. I'll say that again. The universe is not a prison because it is governed according to natural law. The universe is a paradise because it is governed according to natural law. And if anybody continues to think of this dark Gnostic version of the universe as hell, that everywhere in the universe it's just, it's just you know, this prison for souls. It's this, you are subscribing to the dark Luciferian worldview. The worldview which actually keeps a, the earth a prison. Okay? Natural law is in place so that the beings that are within creation, who, who are granted free will and the ability to understand the laws of creation by the creator of the universe, natural law exists for the optimum benefit of those beings, so that they can create a just world where the beings within are equal according to rights. And when you live in a society like that, freedom is generated. Peace is generated, harmony is generated, safety is generated, prosperity is generated. In other words, heaven. Everything we say we want. Natural law and understanding it and living in alignment with it is what brings all those things. So how do these people get away with creating this little pocket of the prison? They're not actually doing it, folks. They're getting other people to do it for them. They're getting their slaves to build the prison for them. And this goes to the issue of moral culpability. Who is more morally culpable? And culp moral culpability means you are determining who is at fault or at blame or deserving of blame for actions that were performed that resulted in harm to other beings. That's, that's what the moral culpability of a behavior is all about. You're, you're figuring out who did this behavior and caused that harm and therefore they're responsible. That's what culpability is. It's from the Latin culpa, meaning blame or fault. So I always ask the question, who's more morally culpable? Not who's culpable at all. Both parties are culpable. Both parties contributed to the harm and therefore are at fault. Who's more morally culpable? The order giver or the order follower? It's another thing many people don't want to hear, but the order follower is always more morally culpable. And there's a reason. The order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver because the order follower is the one who actually performed the action. They did it physically, in physical manifestation. And in taking such action, actually brought the resultant harm into physical manifestation. Order following is the pathway to every form of evil and chaos in our world. It should never be seen as a virtue by anyone who considers themselves a moral human being. Order followers have ultimately been personally responsible and morally culpable for every form of slavery and every single totalitarian regime that has ever existed upon the face of the earth. Once again, folks, get as offended as you like about that statement. Nothing you say or feel or do will ever make it untrue. Here's the most devoted cult members to the cult of ultimate evil, to the big cult that runs the world, the cult of the black sun the police and the military. They are the most devoted cult members. And through them being deceived into performing harmful actions against people's rights and freedoms, they are the people who are actually building the prison for the dark Luciferians. 
A cult, by definition, is a system of religious veneration and devotion which espouses beliefs that are dangerous, especially to the, to the lives, rights, and freedoms are those of those who are not its members, who are not in the cult. And the, th the people who pose the greatest threat to me, who have always posed the greatest threat to me personally and to you personally, are the police and military. They are the people who are always going to come knocking at a totalitarian regime. Not the bankers, not the politicians, not the judges, not the lawyers. They're going to be hiding in a hole somewhere. They get the police and military to do their dirty work. That's why they call it a police state. They don't call it a judge state. They don't call it a lawyer state. They don't call it a politician state. They don't call it a banker state. They don't call it a corporation state. They call it a police state. Because the police are the ones who are actually doing the harm to that society through their behavior. I laugh when people accuse me of trying to start a cult with what I'm teaching here. You know, this debate goes on in, in social media and stuff like that. And I have to just laugh hilariously. It's good comedy. You know, it does put a chuckle on my face because it's like, what kind of a good cult leader am I when I'm trying to expose the techniques that cults have been using for tens of thousands of years upon the human species? I'm going to make you aware of all of those techniques, yet I'm trying to start a cult. I'm trying to destroy all cults. I'm trying to destroy all cults. <laughs> cults are the damn problem on this planet. And they need to go away. I'm not looking for followers. I want people to be their own leader. I don't even want to have to be up here on this stage talking. I know this stuff. You know? The, the, amount, of, the amount of sacrifice of time that has been put into wh how, 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 what I've had to do to get this information out to people. It's like, you think that's enjoyable? That's the other thing I laugh about. Family members of mine or fr so-called friends, acquaintances will say, well, you're doing what you enjoy doing. You're interested in it. I'm like, H -h what drugs are you on and how bad are they? You know, you're not even doing any good drugs. <laughs> you know? I mean, seriously. You think I enjoy this? You think I want the world to be this? You think I want this job of telling people that this is the world? Yeah, it makes you real popular. Folks, this, these cult members are the supporters of slavery, plain and simple. Not, not mincing any words, period. That's what they are. They are the supporters of worldwide slavery. Just like these Satanists are the supporters of slavery. But there's way more of these people than there are of them. And they're actively doing their bidding. They're doing the actual behaviors that lead to slavery. The dark occult mockery of its own cult members. You know, not only are those the people who are the supporters of slavery, not only are they doing the bidding of the masters of the world, but they're being ritualistically and symbolically, occultically mocked by the very people who they are serving. I gave an entire presentation on this at Free Your Mind 1 back in 2011. It's called The Occult Mockery of Police and Military Personnel. Highly suggest everyone here watches this video. They do it wordlessly through their symbolism. You look at all the symbolism. You know, we talked about the hypercube being the symbol of hell on the forehead. They wrap the floor of the house of Freemasonry, the symbol of the first degree tracing board, the floor of the house, means base consciousness, not understanding natural law, not knowing the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. That's what the checkerboard represents. They're putting it around these people's brains, wrapping it around their brain. Inverted uh, satanic pentagram symbolism, putting it all over the third eye and the crown chakra on the head, combining it with the checkered floor of the house. Here's more symbolism. The goddess, the Statue of Liberty, inside. The goddess of freedom inside the inverted pentagram. Then you have the octagon representing the hypercube. Oh, wait a minute. We have two squares of, of stars there. Another hypercube symbol. You know, this is the trifecta here. You know, you got, oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. What's this? Oh, that's a trapezoid. 
I mean, how, how much more do you want? You know, here's the double square on this one, upholding the crown's right. You can go, I can go on and on forever. That's another thing Jay and I talked about. We're like, all the stuff we're talking about, we're barely scratching the surface. We could talk about this for days. You can go deep into all the symbolism and the mockery and all the different organizations that are interconnected. During the entirety of the time I interacted with dark occultists, they referred to the police and military only according to these two terms. They called them our dogs and our pets. Nothing else, no other term was ever used. I never heard them say the word police, ever. Ever. They called them our dogs. And for a long time, I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. It was like, I'm, I'm like, what are these people talking about, our dogs? What dogs? <laughs> and then I finally made the connection. Whoa, they're talking about the police. They call the police their dogs. And it's not like, yo, dog, you know, you're, you're, you're my boy. It's not, it's not street lingo. They're calling them animals that are easily made into obeying their commands because they break their will. And they symbolize this by giving them dog tags in the military. This is, this is a perfect representation of how dark occultists see the police. I, I, I could, if I drew that, it could not have been any more perfectly represented. I don't know who did it, but whoever drew that knows exactly how dark occultists think about cops. Exactly. Okay? Because they are the puppet masters and these people are their puppets. The military and the police are in this position. And their ego is so strong and their free will is so destroyed that they look at it as a badge of honor to be in this position. As a badge of honor. Now, when you're doing something like that in dark occultism, you know you really have something strong going. Okay? Not only that, the people who these people who the po police attack dogs and military attack dogs are oppressing, look at that position as being some kind of a badge of honor and think it's honorable and virtuous. You're members of a cult. Police and military and those who are supporting them, you are cult members. It doesn't matter whether you don't believe it. It doesn't matter whether you don't think it's true. It doesn't matter whether you can't accept that because your ego is in the way. These are the people who own you. And they think they're legitimate in that ownership. I attended a ritual on Valpurgisnacht in 1997 in Whitehall, Maryland, just south of the Pennsylvania border. And it was in what you might call a mansion or a McMansion, you know, not a high-end mansion, but, you know, very, very rich neighborhood, let's put it that way. And after the ritual, there was a gathering in one of the rooms near the front of the house, and there was some refreshments served. And I was talking to a gentleman who looked something like this guy here. And this isn't an exact accurate rendition. A listener to my uh, radio show and podcast drew this for me from a description I made. Uh, technically, this person was outside, so if you look at that as a door there and he was on the other side of the door, it would have been much more accurate. He was guarding the ritual house, a member of the police. And again, Jay told you stories about the police operating in art and basically being aware of murders that were being done in their district and basically saying, you know, better luck in the next life, kid. We know who's running this place. They're our, they're our bosses. They sign our paychecks. So you're, you're shit out of luck. You know, um, they got a police officer to actually guard the ritual house on this high holiday of the satanic year. Technically, he would have been on the other side of a closed door here, uh, but it was a glass door. So you could, well, it wasn't a glass door. There was a, a big window there, and the door was closed and locked. And he was on the outside of it on, on like a patio. But you could see him through the door. And while I might have been standing like, you know, over here in front of this guy, um, he's absolutely laughing about how these people 
who we consider lower than trash are guarding us in our homes while we perform the rituals that we perform. And here's what his laugh sounded like. <laughs> Almost identical. The, 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 the choking or gagging aspect was even more like heightened because he was like eating while he was laughing. He was eating and drinking while he was laughing, like food, food in his mouth, okay? Like a gluttonous slob. And I'm telling you, you know that, that cackle or that force, like you can't even draw, you're laughing so hard you can barely draw another breath in? That's what it sounded like, okay? This is what these people think of the police. And you know what? Can't say I blame them. I think about them the same way. They're that big of a joke. You would enslave your own kind. What bigger kind of a joke is there? What kind of lower form of life is there than that? You deserve to be laughed at like that. You deserve to be laughed at like that. Here's what they call the people. Never referred to the population, human beings, the people of earth, never, never once. They call us the dead. Well, they don't call the people in this room the dead, but they call the vast majority of the human population the dead. And they call people the dead because they don't exercise their thoughts, they don't exercise their emotions. They don't exercise their actions. If you're not trying to gain wisdom, your thoughts are dead. One of the three aspects of consciousness. If you don't care about what's really going on around you or in the world regarding your freedom, your emotions are dead. Care has been cremated. So the population is ignorant, they're apathetic, and they're inactive. They're cowardly, they're lazy. Their actions are deadened. So if all three aspects of what makes a person a human being, an alive human being, are inactive, for all intents and purposes, they could be looked at as dead, totally unconscious. That's how these occultists look at people. And therefore, their rationale is, we're not even doing this to a living soul. The soul hasn't even been activated. It's not really alive. It's just some clump of flesh that's animated. That's all. And they're performing these actions to a dead corpse. You know, that's how they look at us. It's not hard to see why, though. You know? It's what all these zombie movies are about. I, you know, my, my, my friend told me, I, I talk to people and I try to tell them, the zombie movies are about us. They're about the human population. They're not about like some outbreak, a vir viral outbreak that's going to happen and turn people into this. They're about the human population being dead, being spiritually dead. And pe people are like saying to him, no, 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 you're wrong. That's not what it's about. Yes, it is. That's what zombie movies are about. They're about the population being spiritually deadened beings and overtaking the earth. Because they're certainly doing it. And here's a Bohemian Grove ritual about the dead from 1904. <clears throat> They're presiding over a funeral of, it may be difficult to see from afar in this image with the lighting in here, but it says, here lies Gus. You know, another name for the everyman, the average Joe. You know, we're all Gus. And it says, born every minute and died August 8th, 1904. A sucker is born every minute. You know, that's how they view people. You know, they're, they're living, they're presiding over the funeral, you know, with the dead in the ground, with the mockery tombstone, just mocking us. 
Here's how they see us all. I broke this down, this image down with Jay Parker on an episode of my podcast. Here's the poets as they refer to themselves. It's a division of Bohemian Grove, one of the encampments as they refer to them. <clears throat> and I'm referring to this painting in the background, which I'm going to uh, blow up and enhance, okay? Here's some Bohemian Grove dark occult members. And they painted this painting while they were at the Grove. And you see it depicts a line, like a procession of human beings. And it's all different types of human beings changing as they go for forward to different kind of people. So we're going to look at that progression. So let let's blow this up and look at the rear portion of the procession here, being led up here, moving this way. Well, in the back you have the hunter-gatherer types, the people actually living in balance in the natural world. They see them as barbarians, okay? Basically only taking what they need from the earth, living off the land, you know, that's, that's barbarism, okay? The old hunter-gatherer types of human beings. And then as you move forward, you get into husbandry and farming, etc. So that's the next level of so-called human evolution. So let's move forward. Well, then we have two classes of people. You might call this the poor or the lower class, you know, and then you have the aristocracy or the upper class, or at least the middle, you know, you're moving here toward the middle class here. There's even kind of like a separation. You have who they consider, you know, the slovenly and, and you know, uh, just uh, degraded aspect of society. And you have here, here's the poor. They're all like, you know, waifs practically you know, practically starving. You got this guy who's got a little bit of something or bread maybe, you know, but he's still like really emaciated. Then you have the aristocracy, you know, they're, they're the moneyed and culture, so-called cultured people, you know, who are doing a little bit better than everybody else. And then in front of the aristocracy is the strong man, the police and military. That's who he represents. He keeps the rest of the population isolated from the true ruling class. So when we go forward, okay, who's in front of him? The bankers. But they're not the ultimate ruling class. They're the ones still doing the bidding of the ultimate ruling class, which is the guy in the black top hat, the dark occultist. Okay, now, he's being heralded by this herald, who is the media, constantly in front and announcing the arrival and controlling the public perception. And he has a slave who looks like, you know, a, 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 a black person from that, that day perhaps, or it almost looks like a, some kind of a mongrel type being, but it's obviously a very racist statement too because they clearly try to depict it as an African American man. This is how they see the people, folks. This is how they see you. This is how they see me. This is how they see their dogs and even the high-level financial magicians who there are ultimately doing their bidding, okay? But he's not out in front, he's out in front. He's the one setting the pace, he's the one setting the agenda. I mean, if you can't see it, I don't know what to tell you. These people are telling it to your face practically, but not in words. They do it in pictures, they do it in symbols. Behind closed doors, they do it in words, out in the open, very frankly. Mini-me Satanism. This is the other way that they continue to keep their control and keep, continue to run the world. It's what I call mini-me Satanism, and it's what most of this whole society subscribes to. Mini-me Satanism. Everybody wants the Iron Throne, right? Nobody wants to destroy the Iron Throne. See, it's like Russian dolls, a doll within a doll within a doll. It's all just a fractal image of itself, you know? The big Satanists up here, you know, they, they know a lot more about the whole ideology, but then they got the little Satanists down here. It's just a, a, a mimic of the ideology at a lower level, a mimicking of it, you know? 
We don't want to destroy this. No, we want to take this and we want to use it for our own benefit to throw a Game of Thrones uh, allegory in there. Hope most people get that reference. The tenets of Satanism are live only for yourself. There is no such thing as right and wrong, truly. The most ruthless should ultimately rule and they should ultimately get rid of who they don't want. Most people think like that. Even at a lower level, they might not very consciously fully vocalize that, but you know what? You ask most of your friends and family members, and I guarantee you the majority of them are going to say, I pretty much believe that. That's the natural order of things. Just like Nicholas Schreck was saying back when he was a Satanist. This is the natural order. Bullshit. There's nothing natural about it, and it'll never lead to order. This societal Satanism has to go before we could ultimately do anything about the problem of this big cult. Because as long as this ideology is entrenched in the masses of people, at a fractal level, we are ascribing, we are subscribing to the same ideologies that is the same ideology that is ultimately enslaving us. And therefore we can never be free as a result of taking that ideological position. When you look at our society, is our culture systemically satanic? Are we infected with the old religion? Oh, you better believe we are. It's everywhere. Me, me, me thinking 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 and a quarter days a year. You try to tell people what's going on, and they say, I don't care, I don't want to know about that stuff. I want to live for today. I want to live for my pleasure pursuits. The goal of life is to pursue happiness. Hedonistic pursuits. And some people will say, oh, that's the best revenge is living well. well I have no problem with success and prosperity. That's what I'm telling people I want, and I, I, they should want too. But when you make that the goal of life, as opposed to being moral and free, you're missing what this entire existence is all about. And most people are stuck in that. They're stuck in that trap for the soul. Hedonistic pleasure pursuits and living only for me, 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 me. It's what our whole culture is based on. It's what they got people believing is the point of life instead of to learn and to grow in consciousness. Is our culture systemically satanic? I ask once again. Are we supporting the very cult members who are enslaving us? And are they supporting their very occult overlords who are enslaving them in turn? That's why we have to do away with this notion that, you know, because we're doing it, it must be right. You know, so many people blindly supporting this country and, and its military and police. The answer is get out. I got out. I got out when the getting was good. That's called the 23 skidoo. Well, you know what? The getting might not be so good anymore. It's going to be harder and harder to get out of this as we go deeper and deeper into it. It's like quicksand. In other words, quit your cult. This has been my motto, my dictum, you know? It's been my mantra over the last year. Quit the cult. The cult is not interested in helping you. It doesn't want to help you. It doesn't want to protect you. It wants to own you. How do you quit the cult? In What on Earth is Happening, when I first did the initial series years ago, almost a decade ago now, about nine years ago. I gave in the solution section the three R's, and they were respect, remembrance, and uh, the third one was, hold on, respect, remembering, and responsibility, okay? So those three R's are what I want to reiterate upon as the way out of the big cult, how to get out. However, 
I'm going to give a new three R's to complement the original three R's of respect, remembering, and responsibility. Repentance is the true form of self-respect. And this is a religious term, as it is most often used. It means saying that you're sorry, making an apology for wrongdoing and wrong thinking. It means saying the most powerful three words that can ever be spoken by a human being. The second most powerful three, three words that can be spoken by a human being is I love you. The most powerful phrase that can be spoken by a human being is I was wrong. That's why so few people say it. They can't get their ego out of the way. You know how many thousands of times I had to admit to myself that I was wrong and I was participating in something that was completely screwed up? Tens of thousands of times. That's the hardest thing there is to do for a human being because you have to admit you were duped. You got fooled. You got played. And I was wrong. I was duped and I got played. But I was at least man enough to be able to say that to myself. How many people are man or woman enough to be able to utter those words? I know people in my own family who have knowingly said untruths about me or let untruths be spoken about me that they knew were not the truth and can't say years later to me, I was wrong about that and I shouldn't have gone along with that or just let that be spoken about you unchallenged. Just because they can't get their ego out of the way and they, those words can't leave their mouth. It's like Arthur Fonzarelli on Happy Days. I was, I was, and he can't get the word out. He can't say I was wrong, you know? That's how deep the human ego is entrenched. That's how deeply it's entrenched. That's what Satanism is. That's what the force called Satan is. It's the force that will not allow us to admit we were wrong or duped. Overcoming the ego-bound consciousness ultimately means truly being able to say I was wrong and to change your behavior by desisting in wrong action and taking up right action. This comes from respect. This is what true self-respect is. This comes from true self-respect. You have to develop self-respect to be able to say you were, were wrong. That's why they say it takes a big man or, or it takes a real man or a real woman to admit that they were wrong because they respect themselves, truly. The word respect derived from Latin, the Latin prefix re meaning again and the Latin verb spectare which means to look at. True self-respect means taking another look at yourself. And sometimes you don't like what you see because you recognize you were involved in something that was wrong. And you have to admit that to move forward. That's what taking the step into the repentant personality is all about. This is what real repentance is. The second R of the new three R's is refusal. And this is true remembering because you will refuse to participate in this satanic agenda or ideology when you remember who you truly are, which is a sovereign spiritual being having an experience of growth and learning in the physical domain. Through the knowledge of natural law, an awakened human being who truly remembers who they are is finally able to speak, able to speak the lost word, which is no. No is the word of all power. Only when we say no to those who would claim to be our owners do we stop externalizing our power and in doing so reclaim all of our rights as sovereign beings. Engaging in full refusal to participate in the worldwide cult that is enslaving humanity requires tremendous amounts of knowledge, care, and courage. And since so few have those dynamics in that kind of abundance, that's why this word is considered lost. So few people will say no to evil. But that is where the power lies, ultimately, in refusal to participate and cooperate with this agenda. Finally, the third R is rebellion. 
And I don't even mean physical rebellion. I look at real rebellion in life as true responsibility. People think responsibility is how much money you have in your bank account. They think it's what kind of job you have. They think it's either whether you can feed yourself in any given day from day to day. It's not what real responsibility is. I'm, I mean, I'm not knocking any of those things. Nice things to have and be able to do. But real responsibility is doing the great work. And that's rebellion against the unnatural evil order of chaos and death that has taken this planet. The true great work is the arduous task of a influencing others to abandon their religions. The false and dogmatic beliefs which hold back the progress of consciousness by impeding the reception of truth and natural law. It is to help them to realize that in supporting and condoning the legitimacy of authority and government, man's law, based in moral relativism, that they have actually been supporting and condoning the legitimacy of slavery and that they were immoral for having done so. Now that is not any tiny little task, which is why it's not called the tiny little task. It's called the great work. In case, if you haven't noticed, people tend to be very, very attached to their religious beliefs and their cult beliefs. They don't want to abandon them out of fear because it's all they've ever known. And what this great work is ultimately about doing is dragging people, kicking and screaming, into uncharted territory. The undiscovered country of real freedom and real responsibility. And most people don't want to grow, go there because they don't want to grow up. They don't want that knowledge because they don't want the associated responsibility that goes hand in hand with that knowledge and can never be separated from it. You want to know what two of the most powerful words that can ever be spoken are? I will. Now you want to get into the real law of creation. There it is right there. What will you do? That's the question. You know, people say, oh, you... You, you, you make the recognition that all this stuff is wrong. Well, what, what are you going to do about it? A whole lot. And I have done a whole lot. And I will continue to do a whole lot. That's influencing people to understand what's right and what needs to be done. That's the word that needs to be said. Those are the words that need to be said. Don't, don't look at Mark Passio and what he, he's going to do. Say, I will take that responsibility on your own shoulders. What are you going to do? That's true responsibility. And you know what? When you turn your will to that great work, that's true rebellion. <laughs> and I was going to wrap it up there, but I have one more thing for you guys tonight, a little special section that I planned just for today. I call this the hidden God of the occult world, or there is only one God and his name is Bill. <laughs> You're laughing now, but wait till you see this. <laughs> okay. In the ancient world, the solar deity in the oldest civilizations on earth was referred to as Bill or Bell. B-I-L or B-E-L. Now, the actual vowel in the middle is relatively unimportant because ancient languages did not have vowels. If you go back into the ancient um, Sanskrit, Hebrew, Coptic Egyptian, um, uh, uh, Phoenician, um, all of these languages, you know, Sumerian, they didn't really have vowels, okay? The consonant order that we're talking about here is B-L, B-L. It doesn't matter whether it's B-A-L, 
B-E-L, B-I-L, B-O-L, or B-U-L. It's the B and the L that matter, and the vowel sound is able to be substituted. Okay? So here is the god Bel in the Phoenicia Canaan tradition, depicted with another solar deity with rays around his head. But that is one of the oldest uh, stone relief um, depictions of the god Bel or Bill from the Phoenicia Canaan tradition. And again, he was called Bel in the ancient Sumerian tradition as well. He was known in the Babylonian tradition and Akkadian tradition as Baal. Many people will know this name from biblical accounts because the word, the name Baal uh, is given in the Bible. He was depicted as the bull, the golden bull of Sumeria. And again, you saw Baal depicted as a bull holding the golden child, okay? Because he was the sun god. This is all the solar deity, Bill or Bell, or Baal, okay? So here he is in the Mesopotamian tradition as the golden bull. This is, I believe, a uh, golden uh, statue from uh, Iraq, okay? And again, the word bull, B-U-L, there's the name in the word bull, okay? The reason he was depicted as the bull, and again, Satan is depicted as the bull as well, and I'm not telling you that Bill or Bell is just all satanic. It was viewed as the sun, the light, the rejuvenator of the world, etc. It's where these, it's where the solar cult of the ancient world derived this name, okay? And you know what Bill meant? Bill or Bell in, in the ancient world, the, it was an actual term. It wasn't really so much a proper name as it was a title. It meant master. So you can look at that in two ways. You know, is the sun the, the master of light? You know, we're receiving the, 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 the creator's light and we have to develop self-mastery through the light? Or is it about authority and the master, you know, ruling over our lives and telling us what we must and must not do? It's two ways of looking at it, just like there's two aspects to the sun, two aspects to the light. There's the true light aspect and then there's the dark sun. Okay, you have to be able to view these things as having multiple dimensions to them. When you get into the unidimensional way of seeing things, you're missing the point, okay? But the bull, he was depicted as the bull because the sun 6,000 years ago during the Sumerian civilization was in Taurus. The spring equinox was in Taurus then. This is known as the procession of the equinoxes, okay? The sun didn't rise in Pisces on the eastern horizon. It rose in Taurus then. You, you trace the, those amounts of zodiacal houses back in the procession, that's about 6,000 years. That's how old the Sumerian tradition goes back, okay? So Taurus is the bull, and here you have the bull with the sun. It makes perfect sense, okay? Now, we talked about May 1st, the midpoint of Taurus, the bull, being the high point of the occult holiday, the, high, the midpoint of spring being the highest occult Sabbath in the occultic year. And it's called Beltane. Beltane. Bell's wheel. This is the solar wheel. The zodiac is the houses that the sun passes through as a wheel during the course of the year. Well, that's Bell's disc, Bell's wheel, the sun's wheel. The civilization that came out of that time period of the world was Babylon, where all this dark occultism ultimately came out of. Now, the word bill is right in the middle of the word, Babylon. So we break down the word ba. What does ba mean in the ancient languages? It means spirit. Spirit. On. Jay talked about that word. On means light. And then bill, the sun god. So the spirit of the light of bill, or the light of the spirit of bill, the solar deity. That's literally what the name Babylon meant. The light of Bill's spirit, the light of the sun's spirit, okay? Well, what's the God of the world today? It's Bill. So they just named it a Bill, right? Just, it's, it's accidental. There's no connection here. 
What do we want all those bills to do? Well, we need them to pay bills. Bill has to be paid, you know. He, he, he wants money. You know, that's his thing. So we have to acquire bill to pay bill. The people who have the most of these bills are the billionaires. The ruling class are billionaires. They long ago took all the gold bullion. Ever wonder why it's called bullion? It's named after their god, the bull. Well, on Wall Street, there's their god, the golden bull of Wall Street. They always want bull markets. They don't like it when there's bear markets. They want the bull market. And when there's not a bull market happening, they want a bailout. It's just an accident. It's all coincidence. They distract us with ball games. All the males of society, are or most of them anyway, are distracted by the ball. Keep your eye on the bouncing ball. Don't worry about your freedom and rights being taken away. All manner of ball games. Baseball, basketball, football, soccer is played with a soccer ball, tennis with a tennis ball, golf with a golf ball. You can go on and on and on. Bowling. I even like bowling myself. You know, I have a couple of bowling balls. <laughs> so, you know, ball games provide distractions. You know, the young people of society, they want to grow up to either be a bell or a baller. You know, baller street term for you know, like the super, you know, rich, uh, you know, guy who, you know, who's, he's the cool, rich dude who, you know, got his money from gaming. And the bell, you know, we, we our y young women want to just grow up to be pretty. This is the word associated with beauty. Bell means beautiful, you know, from their sun god, you know, the beautiful deity. They distract us with Billboards, it's where all the advertising goes to put subconscious messages into the mind. The, the top singles in, in pop culture, music, which the dark occult worked through, is called the billboards. Actors are given billing in Hollywood. The masons are referred to as the builders, whether they be builders of the light or dark builders. We're all builders of society. Two of the big forces ushering in political, negative political change, communism and Zionism. And these were led by the Bolsheviks and the Balfour Declaration. All right there in, in the word. The biggest, one of the biggest secret societies, the biggest think tank, occult secret societies in the world is the Bilderberg Group. Well, you think that's accidental that the first place they met, met was the Bilderberg Hotel? Bilderberg means the foundation of Bill. Or in other words, the rock upon which Bill's church is built. And believe me, it is being built upon that foundation. We have a prince in the royal family of England that is going to become king at some future point, and his name is Bill, Prince William. Well, the, you think they named the future king Bill or William accidentally? I don't think it is. That's their god. That's why the English royalty vacation at Balmoral Castle. They, they go there to learn the morals of Bill, of Baal. Okay, And the castle where the most ritual sacrifice during any given year is, is held is Amarwa. I mean, look at the, look at the accounts that Fritz Springmeier gathered uh, and also uh, that I believe Bryce Taylor talked about the things that go on at Amarwa. Or perhaps it was, um, um, I can't remember who did the, uh, rep, uh, talked about the reptilians with David Icke. Arizona Wilder, thank you. Arizona Wilder talked about the occult rituals that take place, the sa human sacrifice rituals that take place at Amarwa Castle. Where is it located? It's located in Bouillon, Belgium. Which is, uh, by the way, Belgium is the proposed seat of the world government. 
at Brussels. Now, bullion, named after the sun bull god, Bell or Bill, just happens to be directly next to another little settlement called Munio. So you have Munio and Bullion, the sun and the moon. It's coincidence, though. You might think this is all baloney. I think people just can't see the connections because they're a little bullheaded. They're rigidly attached to their belief system. And that's the belief systems, the belief systems that they give everybody. And Jay talked about it as the lie is in there as well. Bell's lies. The dark sun gods and the dark solar cults lies. I think it's going to take a lot of courage, otherwise known as boldness or having some balls, to really change the trajectory that we're on as a species. I think we need to be hit, we need to be struck with noetic lightning, with the lightning bolts. And maybe the light bulb will go on. And then maybe people will start paying attention to things like the Bill of Rights and the Liberty Bell, positive symbols for human freedom in our society. Maybe they could even listen to some of the words of wisdom in the New Testament of the Bible, the Bible. Maybe once we start doing that, we'll develop the ability to achieve balance. Because that's ultimately what it's all about, folks. It's about bringing the balance of the sacred masculine and sacred feminine dynamic together in that sacred union. And when we do that, and we understand natural law, maybe things won't have to get belligerent, and we won't have to use bullets to get this change done. If we do it the right way, we could put an end once and for all to this bullshit called human slavery. Thank you. And, and you know, when we do that, we truly will have hit the spiritual bullseye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and attention.